Friends, a very good. Uh, what day is it? It's Wednesday, right? It feels like this is this is. Uh, I'm just gonna say, look out in the best way because this show is like. Uh, can a, can a runaway train be a positive, Sam Brooks? I think that uh, this this shows a runaway train in a great way because it's a Wednesday uh, that does not feel like a Thursday. With Thursday is the new Friday with with a with the New Year's Eve coming. It in means, a very weird way, this feels like a Friday. It feels like a Friday. Yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, like we're like like I'm. I, I just noticed you on the audio board. You just pulled my pot down a little because I'm so excited. I'm so excited about this Wednesday, Jan- uh, December thirtieth show. Uh, first of all, we're jam packed. We've got four. It's very rare here on Real Talk because we're supposed to leave some time for like real talk. Uh, we want to be, you know, getting to our comments sections, uh, our live stream on YouTube and the community that gathers there, the neighbors that, that gather there, these new friends that are that gather there every day. Uh, we want to read the, the tweets that are sent into our hashtag Real Talk RJ, like like from Fish Fan 403. Uh, with the Calgary Stampeders uh, helmet as the logo, so the 403, the stamps, l- leads me to believe that that Fish Fan is tuning in from Calgary or surrounding area anyway. A shout-out and a good morning uh, to Southern Alberta. Fish, uh, in in my opinion, an underrated band, unless you're talking to the, to Fish fans, in, in which case there's no way they're underrated. They're the greatest band of all time to Fish fans. Uh, fish with a PH. <laughs> I'm already way off track here. I'm just excited. What do you want me to do? Uh, the shout out to Fish fan who said, I am now a proud patron of Real Talk. This this tweet was just about a half an hour ago. I'm a proud patron of Real Talk with Ryan Jesperson on Patreon, and you should be too. And then Fish Fan uh, pushes out the link to to support us on Patreon. You can find that at ryanjesperson.com. You're going, what's, like, honestly, Jesperson, you're like two minutes in, two minutes into the show, and you're already hitting us up with a cash call? Well, here's why. Here's why I'm letting you know is because if, if, if you typically find us on YouTube or you download our podcast or or you listen live, you audio stream on Mixler or you catch the show late. There's so many different ways to catch Real Talk. This is the new media. Uh, you're going to wonder tomorrow morning, where are we? You're, you're going to go, it's 8.30, it's Thursday, it's a weekday morning, uh, it's not a stat, it's New Year's Eve morning, but it's not a stat, so where are you guys? <clears throat> and we're going to be reminding you through today's show that tomorrow... December 31st, New Year's Eve morning at 8.30, we will be pushing out a live but private party. We're going to do a private Q&A show tomorrow for our Patreon subscribers. So these are people that that uh, each and every month, they, they donate five bucks or so, some, some of you a little bit more, which we really, really, really appreciate uh, through Patreon. And, uh, and, and of course, you allow us, you know, to continue to dream big and to, to grow what we're doing here, to extend, expand the depth of our coverage, to better outfit our studio, to do a more, a more professional presentation, if you will. Uh, and so, so we want to say thank you to our Patreon subscribers. So tomorrow, it's literally a huge zoom call that's what it is and we've got it all set up and we're super excited for it we've got room for 500 people and so it'll be a maximum 
uh, with Sam and I. So I guess 498 of you, uh, a maximum of 500 people will be there. We expect it to be a lot of fun. If 10 people decide to show up, if the rest of you are like, yeah, it's New Year's Eve morning, we're going to sleep in or, or whatever the case may be, you're going to head out and you're like in the hot tub by seven in the morning. You're like, don't bother me. My devices are put away. I commend you for that. You can always catch the show later. Uh, but if you do care to join us, I think it's going to be a really fun conversation. We're going to mix and mingle. We're going to treat it like the vision was to have an in-person party. We wanted to do a real talk New Year's party for our Patreon subscribers, our Patreon supporters, uh, you know, some sort of like a, a theater set up, kind of a live show presentation, maybe catered with some kind of a breakfast. Anyway, we were dreaming big year one. Right. But with the pandemic, there's no way we can pull that off. So we're going to do a big Zoom party tomorrow. So if you want to be part of that, it's not too late to sign up to support us on Patreon. You can do it at ryanjesperson.com. Just look across the top bar of the website, and we'll be sending out that private Zoom link uh, a little later on today or, or in the early wee morning hours of tomorrow with enough time for you to get all set up, and we're very much looking forward to that show. Big show today. We've been wanting to talk about... Uh, Strip mining, coal mining in the Canadian Rockies. Uh, so we're going to be talking to a guy that has been down there in the beautiful, you know, that 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 area, the Highway 22 area through. Some, I mean, Fish Fan 403 is probably traveling this area all the time. Having grown up there myself in, in South Calgary, you know, we, we knew it as 22X Marquis of Lauren Trail. It then heads into if you're heading on your way down to the Crow's Nest Pass, you know, that beautiful part of Western Canada. You've traveled this Highway 22 and you get down into it. It goes down into some of the most beautiful country. Uh, I'm right now envisioning I'm on this mental exercise that takes me back to the days of summer road trips to the gorge um fish fan can talk fish all they want uh I'll sit here and talk Dave Matthews until I'm blue in the face but a Dave Matthews weekend at the gorge in George Washington is one of the most wonderful music venues one of the most wonderful shows you'll ever be at the road trip down there through Alberta involves this beautiful highway. You travel through southern Alberta and you kind of imagine what it was like 100 years ago when ranchers really started to started to settle in there and started to set up these sprawling cattle ranches, these, these horse operations that now they say are being threatened. They say their water's being threatened. And if, if, if you're in the business of raising animals and if you're in the business of ranching, there's not much you care about more than your water. Well, this is the part of the province where Andrew Nikiforic has been speaking with ranchers about Alberta's plan, Alberta rescinding its coal policy to allow for new open pit strip mining in the Rocky Mountains. We're going to talk about that in just a second. We're also going to try to make some sense of what's going on with Alberta parks. Now, if you talk to the government, you're going to hear one thing, the Alberta government. If you talk to the official opposition, you're going to hear another thing. Uh, maybe you've been walking your dog through your neighborhood and, and you've been seeing these signs that, that some of your neighbors probably have up on their lawns. They look like the election signs, but they say, save my Alberta parks. Well, the government says, you know, the government line on this is, you know, hey, we're taking the responsible steps here. The opposition move, the opposition proclamation this week has been, hey, we forced them to walk back their plan to sell off your parks. We could bring a government representative on this show. <laughs> Maybe we could definitely bring an opposition member on this show and, and they could probably go back and forth, though. They probably wouldn't appear together. You get the sense. We told you this a while ago. We're not going to do some boring show bringing you a bunch of lame politicians. We're going to bring you people that know what the hell they're talking about. So the former superintendent of Banff National Park. Uh huh. The guy that has held the top office in Banff National Park. He's a conservationist. He's an author. I think Kevin Van Tiggum's written like. What is it off the top of my head? 14 or 15 books, something like that. He's a great interview every time I talk to him. I mean, this is the guy where we can be talking about Alberta parks or, or national parks, and then I'll say, hey, hey, can you can we talk real quick about, like, you know, the grizzly bear hunt in B.C.? Or, or, hey, what do you know about healthy caribou populations and wolves and the call and, like, people shooting wolves from helicopters? He knows all about. So whenever you talk to Kevin Van Tegum, you can really get into one. Looking forward to that conversation. Those are some pretty strong back-to-back -back environmentally focused interviews that we're going to be doing this morning, kicking off in just a moment. Then Brandy Morin will join us. Brandy is, is such a talented storyteller. She's a courageous storyteller, which says something. She, she's, she's, she's been covering stories involving Indigenous Canadians uh, for years and years, and she has been rewarded for her efforts. She's a decorated journalist, an award-winning journalist, and we're lucky to have her uh, making an appearance on today's show, which will be our, our final, I, I'm going to call it our final broadcast for 2020, uh, even though we've got that private party it's, it's tomorrow. It's our final broadcast. It's our final broadcast. 
podcast. That's yes. right. What, so, so tomorrow's more of like it's a party. Like the, you and I are going to have uh, sort of creamy coffees, and we're going to be doing these types of things. I wouldn't put it past Sam. The guy's the guy's a maniac. He'll get into the beer. For, if 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 we were, if there weren't responsibilities for Sam to cover behind the audio board and running the show, I, I suspect. And I don't mean to slander you here, Sam, but I suspect that Sam might already be into the beer fridge on on a New Year's Eve morning at eight thirty nine a.m. like this. So so we'll find out. But tomorrow's going to be good. So our final broadcast of the year, Brandy Morin joins us today around nine thirty. She's got a piece coming up in the Toronto Star. She's covering the top 20 Indigenous stories in Canada for 2020. Uh, The top 20, I think we might have just lost our feed there, Sam. It looks like we've lost our video. Don't worry, we'll be back. There we are. Oh, that was just the monitor, I think, maybe that got unplugged. We're doing this live on the fly. How exciting. Brandy's covering the top 20 Indigenous stories for 2020. She's going to join us. We're not going to get into all 20 uh, want to leave something uh, that, that'll prompt you to go click on that link to check out our piece in the star. Plus, we got about a half hour, 25 minutes of our time. So we're going to get into that, a very valuable focus. And then wrapping up today's show, he's a Stanley Cup champion. He's the former captain of the Edmonton Oilers. And last night, he looked like he was close to blowing a gasket after he visited the outdoor Victoria Oval Rink in Edmonton, the ODR at the Victoria Rink along River Valley Road. Uh, Andrew Ference is going to join us, a former Calgary Flame, former Boston Bruin, former Edmonton Oiler, as you know. Um, I'm going to find out why he was going so nuts about nobody wearing masks. He was talking about crop dusting, and, and it was kind of an entertaining series of tweets, but I think he was also trying to get a point a, a, across. We'll find that balance, that crossroad between government mandates, legislation, and personal responsibility. So that's going to be coming up around 10 o'clock today. Plus, obviously, we'll talk about the World Junior Hockey Championship and a shortened NHL season uh, that's set to begin on, on January 13th. So we'll get into that with Fur Knuckle, with uh, Andrew Ference, former Edmonton Oilers captain. Uh, but of course, all of this uh, is presented by our sponsors this morning, including the team at Bitcoin Well. They are our title sponsor. That's why we give them a shout out first each and every show, and it's going to be a big 2021 for Bitcoin Well. I know if you talk to them or if you talk to anybody that's into Bitcoin right now, they're going to tell you, it's going to be a big 2021 for Bitcoin, too. Now, I can't make you that guarantee. And don't cash out all your RSPs and buy Bitcoin based on my advice. Make sure you talk to your advisors, and that could include the team at Bitcoin. Well, they're the safest and easiest way to buy and sell Bitcoin, and they're proudly headquartered in Edmonton, soon to go public. And we'll talk about that more in the new year when we sit down again with their founder and CEO, Adam O'Brien. All right, let's rock. Real Talk starts now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Well, as mentioned, Alberta has 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 been making news lately. Uh, well, for a number of reasons, uh, we'll be talking about the COVID response and the vaccinations, all that coming up in the news around nine o'clock today. But the province, you know, abolished last May Alberta's coal policy and it's led to uh, permits granted to an Australian mining company in particular we'll get to Andrew Nicky Fork on this he's the expert he's the one covering the story it's certainly raising the concern raising the ire I think it might be fair to say of Alberta ranchers and other uh, engaged citizens that are concerned about the future and the environmental impacts of this on the Canadian Rocky Mountains. Uh, Andrew Nikiforek is a journalist for the TIE, and he's been kind enough to join us, kind enough uh, over the phone this morning. Uh, Andrew, before we before we get into this, uh, before we start talking about coal and the Canadian Rockies, I absolutely loved our email exchange when I pitched you on this. You said, "Hey, listen, I'm all for an interview." You said, "But I don't do Zoom." It sound you said you said this is something you're just you're, you're not into it. You're still a phone guy. Uh, you're you're committed to this. What is it about tech? I'm always curious to pick people's brains. Uh, uh, what, what is it about tech that has you saying, uh, "Yeah, no thanks." Um, <laughs> I guess I'm old fashioned, Ryan. Uh, I just prefer uh, the phone. It's more it's it's more direct. Um, it's not as distracting. Um, and uh, it's a technology that invites that still invites conversation. So that, that's why I prefer it. Yeah, you know, I, I was talking to a buddy the other day and I had sent him a message. He didn't get back to me for about a week. <clears throat> he got back to me yesterday. 
And he said, I'm sorry. He said, I put all my devices away for the entire Christmas week. He just put them away, like in a drawer. He didn't even touch them. And he said that the impact it had on him has him thinking about his device usage in 2021. In other words, it was kind of a long enough period of time that it was a wake-up call for him, which I thought was I thought was pretty neat. Was this something that you walked back in your life, or have you always been this way? I've always been suspicious of new technologies and their impact on our lives because they change everything we do. And in fact, I, you know, the more devices we appear to have, the more they engineer our lives in very specific and often very tyrannical ways. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm an old fashioned conservative. I don't believe in using a lot of devices. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, Andrew, we're, we're grateful that you've agreed to join us on the show this morning. I can tell you when we've been inviting our audience members, you know, this show is like, you know, five, six weeks old. Uh, so we're, we're kind of just getting it off the ground. Every, everybody's feeling out the process of, of submitting ideas for editorial coverage. There is a recurring theme that viewers and listeners are keen for us to touch on. We're seeing it every day on our email inbox, uh, talk at ryanjesperson.com. People are saying, please, can you help us understand better? Can you help us understand more about what's going on with coal mining in the Canadian Rockies? You've been covering this story for mm. months, for months at the tie.ca. Can you give us a little bit of background? Why don't we start back in May, or if you think we can rewind even further than that, uh, when the Alberta government rescinded this coal policy? What, what led to that, and, and, and what was the obvious significance of it? Well, I, I think the government has been thinking, uh, the, the current government of uh, Premier Kenny um, has been debating for nearly a year uh, um, about um, uh, intensive lobbying to get rid of the coal policy. And most of the lobbying has come from the Coal Association of Canada and come from Australian coal miners. And the coal policy, most Albertans don't really understand it, but it, uh, it it's an old policy. It's 44 years old. It was the vision of Peter Lougheed back in the days when politicians actually had visions. Uh, it was a product of six years of uh, public consultation with Albertans about the future of the eastern slopes of the Canadian Rockies. And Albertans made it very clear to Lougheed that what they wanted was the they wanted the mountains left intact. Uh, the mountains protect water supply for two million people that live on the prairies, and um, and they are kind of the iconic symbol of this province. So Lougheed came up with the coal policy that basically said, you know what, um, these mountains are vastly important. Uh, for the province. Therefore, uh, we're going to create four categories and uh, of land in the mountains. And um, the first category will not tolerate any uh, coal mining at all, and that includes the federal and provincial parks. The second category um, said there will be, uh, which is category two, said there will be no uh, open pit mines in the eastern slopes. And then there was third and fourth category that said, yes, there might be some mining allowed here, but here are the conditions. And there were very tough conditions. Uh, the conditions included uh, rigorous assessments, um, extremely high royalties. In other words, a third of the revenue generated by the mines would go to the owners of the resource, the people of Alberta, uh, and a very tough reclamation standards. Now, uh, so in the middle of the pandemic last May, the Kenny government uh, killed this policy, which opened up um, uh, 1.5 million hectares of the eastern slopes to open pit coal money. And it did so uh, because it felt, OK, look, Alberta is in a bind. Uh, oil prices are down. Uh, the industry uh, is struggling mightily. Why don't we kickstart another mining industry uh, in the Rockies and let the Australians come in and do their thing? And um, so with no public consultation at all, other than with the Coal Association of Canada, which is actually run by a former Tory environment minister, um, the Kennedy government killed this policy. Uh, ranchers, irrigators, landowners all up and down, First Nations all up and down the, the eastern slopes said, whoa, wait a moment. <clears throat> 
you can't do this. This is you. You can't remove this policy without public consultation. Um, and so there are now, um, uh, uh, you know, legal challenges to what the Kennedy government is is doing. Andrew, one of the interesting uh, things, I think, one, I mean, there, there's a lot of elements to this story and there's a lot of ground to cover. Uh, if you're just joining us live streaming audio on Mixler, we're talking to Andrew Nikifork, uh, an author, a, a journalist with the TIE. Um, you know, one of the things that jumped out at me is that the Alberta government will face at least two court challenges in January, one of them from landowners. And, and you've spoken to several of them, uh, as well as from the Ermine Skin and Whitefish Lake First Nations, um, two legal battles, which I would imagine have some probably some some common assertions here, but from two different perspectives. What are people telling you? I mean, you're speaking to the to the people that are invested in this part of the of, of Canada. Well, you know, ranching has has is probably the most sustainable industry in the province, and it has been going on in the eastern slopes for a hundred years. Um, and uh, and some of the ranchers that I know have some of the most sustainable and ecologically sound operations possible. I mean, um, they are very respectful of the slopes, um, of its of its diversity, of its grasslands, of its forests. And um, and of its uh, you know great capacity to protect, guard, and secure the water supply for the prairies, and um, and so you know when the government comes along and says you know uh, we're going to change the policy and we now think it's okay to put open pit coal mines in critical watersheds. Now there's two things you need to know about open pit coal mines. One, they consume vast amounts of water. Two, they pollute vast amounts of water with selenium. Now, selenium is a toxic mineral that leaches from the rubble that is created in in the process of removing uh, the tops off mountains. Um, tech mines in British Columbia, just on the other side of the the mountains, has generated um, you know a, a billion dollar problem with selenium pollution. That is, you know, really pissing off the Americans uh, as they see selenium levels rise in their lakes and rivers just south of the border. Um, and and it, this is, could be, you know, a, a problem that lasts for not just hundreds of years, but thousands of years. So now the Alberta government says, well, we want to recreate this problem in the eastern slopes. Um, and um, and we really want to. Uh, to uh, remove water security, not just for ranchers, but for irrigators and everyone else in Southern Alberta. This is an arid region. Water is a scarce commodity. Uh, it is over allocated as is. And, and here we have the government saying, well, don't worry, we're gonna put in these open pit mines. Not only that, we know the coal miners don't have, have enough water to do what they wanna do. So we're gonna make special changes in water allocation rules so that they get more water. Well, where are they going to get that water from? Well, they're going to take it either from uh, fish or they're going to take it from irrigators or they're going to take it from uh, cattle operations um, or from the local municipalities down here. So they are robbing Albertans to provide water for Australian coal miners. Um, you know, uh, it, this is like beyond belief for, for most Southern Albertans why a conservative government would ever go in this direction, except, and we know why, it's, it's out of complete desperation and lack of vision about the future. They don't know what to do given the province's economic doldrums. They think the solution is to uh, kickstart another boom and bust coal mining industry that will destroy uh, more jobs and more parts of this economy uh, then we'll ever generate itself. Andrew, I'm not <clears throat> I'm not going to suggest that uh, if we can make a ton of dough on something, we should destroy the planet. But, but I do think that people might be on board to say, 
you know, for example, if we could get, uh, you know, if we saw oil back at 120 bucks a barrel, uh, people would have, and, and, and Alberta was in a surplus position, and 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 the premier of the day was considering, you know, was in a position and considering sending out prosperity checks of $400 to everybody that lived here, it would bother people a little bit less. I'm just saying this is the human condition. This is human tendency to see big smokestacks belching out pollutants or to see, hear stories of tailings ponds. We, we might say, some of us might might say I mean it's a you know it's it, it's tragic and it's sad but it is the price that we pay for prosperity in this circumstance uh, my understanding is that Alberta doesn't actually even stand to make that much on opening up the eastern <laughs> slopes of the Rockies for coal it sounds like it's a lousy deal for Albertans it's a lousy economic deal from day one. Uh, first of all, uh, the the I mean, and the Australians. Um, so you've got to ask, well, why are the Australians here? Why have we got four different um, Australian coal mining companies, speculators, many of them owned by Australian billionaires? Why are they here in Alberta? Well, they're here because they're looking for a really cheap deal. And that's what the Alberta government is offering them. The Alberta government is saying, look, you can have this coal for one percent royalty. You know, the royalties in Australia are 7%. And here we're offering them 1% royalties. And then the government is saying, well, you know, but these, these guys, are they're going to create lots of jobs. No, nope, coal mining, open pit coal mining does not create a lot of jobs. And in fact, uh, during the pandemic, the one sector that has gone further into automation and uh, and into automated trucks and, and everything else is the mining industry. So the mining industry really isn't interested in employing people. Uh, uh, they're, they're interested in employing machines um, that they can control and run when, when, when they want to because the industry is very bust and boom. I mean, you produce metallurgical coal, and that's the coal we're talking about here, um, when prices are high and you stop producing when prices are low. Um, and there are lots of examples in the province where where other coal mining communities have been shut down uh, or obliterated because of this boom and bust cycle. Um, and then you've got to look at the cost, the cost in terms of water pollution, the cost to other important sectors of the economy, uh, such as, uh, you know, the, the irrigators all around Lethbridge area, uh, the cattle producers all up and down the eastern slopes, not to mention tourism. And really, you know, a government with vision would say, OK, wait a moment. Uh, the Crow's Nest Pass is is one of the most phenomenally beautiful places in Alberta. It has suffered the trauma of underground coal mining. Um, but this is a gem. This is a jewel in the Rockies. Let's actually invest in the Crow's Nest Pass and let's make it the Switzerland of Canada in terms of hiking trails, in, in terms of, uh, of just a beautiful place to visit. Um, so, I mean, that would be a different kind of, of vision. Uh, that's not what the Kenny government has. The Kenny government is, wants to repeat the mistakes of the past. Um, and, uh, and, you know, this is something that, that actually Peter Lockheed, with his coal policy, really wanted to avoid. Um, he wanted what was best for all burdens, and he didn't think destroying the eastern slopes with open pit mines would be economically sound for the province. Um, and he didn't think it would be morally sound for the for the province, and he didn't think it would be ecologically sound for the province. Yeah, and and and, and respectfully, uh, in, in the context of Peter Lahid, which I think is a compliment to him with regards to his vision, we're talking about where the mindsets were at in the 1970s, Andrew. Uh, we're not even talking about 2020. We're not talking about 50 years later. You've touched on this, but but let me ask you about deficits that industry activity can create. Uh, Albertans and Canadians, I know, are grateful for the economic activity that oil and gas has generated. But you, you take a look at Alberta's orphan well. The, the word problem right now is not sufficient. Um, debacle is probably more fitting and, and devastation probably yep. 10 years from now when we really realize what this multi, multi, multi billion dollar deficit looks like with regards to land reclam reclamation, cleaning up these wells and who's going to pay for it. Hint, it's us. Uh, what do the potential risks or what do the actual realized risks look like here with regards to open pit mining and, and reclamation and, and, and the public purse on that? Well, they're enormous. I mean, uh, we, we know 
that Alberta has totally failed to adequately address the issue of abandoned and inactive whale, uh, wells in this province. And we're talking about liabilities here in excess of $100 billion. Um, these liabilities are actually greater than, than many of the assets left in the industry at this point in time. And the mining industry, the coal mining industry, is, is just the same. I mean, you go to any place in the world where there has been active open pit coal mining, mountaintop removal, and what you find um, is environmental destruction and ruin, and followed by economic poverty and ruin. Um, you know, they're, they're, even to use the word reclamation and mountaintop re- removal in the same sentence is is grotesque. I mean, it's it, it you're you're being you're not being truthful. You cannot reclaim a mountain once you take it apart. It is it is it is not possible to do. You will have a, a pile of junk there, uh, a pile of junk leaching toxic selenium and and other toxic minerals um, for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, you you will never restore the biological diversity that you have destroyed. You will never restore the water the the underground water systems, the, the surface water systems, the creeks and all of their fish that were part of that mountain. Um, so, I mean, the, there is no reclamation, really. I mean, it's you're destroying uh, one of the province's most important assets, and, and it's an asset in the sense that these mountains create, secure, and guard our water supply. And with climate change and, and everything else coming boring down on us, um, th- these mountains should be considered sacred places because they ensure that we will have water to drink and work with. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, taking them apart, um, is, uh, is, is a dangerous, a dangerous thing to do. And, and, and for which, you know, maybe Australians might profit temporarily from this, but all burdens will lose big time and we will become uh, uh, a poorer place and a less resilient place if we go ahead with this. Andrew Nikifork, uh, an author. Uh, Andrew, I, I, I was doing the math. It's been, you know, we, we've been, you and I talking for more than 10 years now. I remember a, a very memorable television interview we did a long time ago when your book, The Energy of Slaves, first came out. I've been an avid reader of your work in the Taiyi at the Taiyi.ca, and we really appreciate your, uh, you know, your perspective check, your reality check this morning on this important story. Thanks for making time for us on Real Talk and a very happy new year to you and your family. All right. Thank you very much, Ryan, and a happy new year to you and your listeners. Thanks, Andrew. You can read Andrew's work, as mentioned, at thetie.ca. We're going to be talking to Kevin Van Tegum coming up in just a moment. Wanted to remind you that right now is a fabulous time to upgrade your ride. If you're looking to get the four-wheel drive that you've envied from other drivers, you know you're going to be hitting the highway. You want to just go for a rip there, bud. You want to get somewhere, maybe get to the ODR. you got to get somewhere, some rural pocket of the province where you find your peace and quiet. You're going to go for a snowshoe. You're going to go for a cross-country ski, but you know that rear-wheel drive rig of yours isn't going to get you there, especially if the road conditions aren't great. The Jeep brand has been trusted for decades, and nobody does Jeep better in Western Canada than Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. We're proud to be partners of them. I'm thrilled to be driving one of their 2020 Jeep Grand Cherokees. This thing is an absolute dream. It gives me the confidence I need on the road, and of course, when I'm with my family, there's nothing more important than safety. Go check out Scott and his team. Talk to them for sales and service at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. We're also so grateful for the partnership of the teams at Dairy Queens in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. I, uh, If you follow my Instagram stories, if you follow me on Instagram at Ryan Jesperson, you know I did a bit of a sponsors tour yesterday. I was craving dilly bars. What do you want me to do? So my little guy and I hit the Dairy Queen Westmount drive through and, uh, and Wyatt, my little man, was thrilled to find out that you don't have to buy just one dilly bar. In fact, they'll sell you a box of six of them. Plus, we got into those famous DQ burgers. I forgot how good their onion rings are. Make sure you support the six locations that Mark and Michael own because they're proud partners here of us at Real Talk. It's the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. 
Before we get to Kevin Van Tiggum, let's take a look at what's making headlines on this Wednesday morning. Well, this uh, a story uh, out of the province of Alberta when it comes to inoculations, when it comes to vaccinations. At this point, the Alberta government said they were aiming to have 29,000 Albertans inoculated, vaccinated. We're looking at about, well, much less than that. Uh, we're, we're way behind the national average. As a matter of fact, Alberta's second last in the country when it comes to those who have received the vaccination per 100,000 citizens. Ontario is the one lagging behind us, by the way. It's prompted some fire from politicians in opposition and former politicians like former Alberta Liberal Party leader David Kahn, who's been more outspoken on Twitter since he left than he ever was in the role. He points out that Premier Jason Kenney admitted Alberta Health Services was withholding the second dose of vaccines for those vaccinated. Alberta Health Services took the stat holidays of Christmas off. They weren't working flat out, says the Premier's ordering changes, but says David Kahn, listen, the swift rollout of these vaccines is life or death. Now, I think it's safe to say we all expect that there's going to be some glitches in rollout of this, but people need to have confidence that those vaccines are going to people that need them and going there now. I saw Darren Markland, the ICU doc, tweeting yesterday, the knowledge there's a good vaccine out there makes every death these days that much more heartbreaking. How about this story out of Ontario? This is wild. Ontario's uh, minister, MPP Rod Phillips, you see this? The guy is in hot water. It's Ontario's finance minister, a senior minister in Premier Doug Ford's cabinet. Well, he's been in St. Bart's, on the island of St. Bart's with his family, despite the fact that he's got all these pre-taped videos his staff are sending out. Did you see him? On this Christmas Eve, he says, sitting by his fireplace, sipping his cup of eggnog. The guy's on an island with sand between his toes. Unbelievable. He's facing fire from media and from his constituents, most importantly. Nadine Youssef from the Toronto Star released this yesterday. She covers a, a statement that was released by Ontario's finance minister. He says, I deeply regret traveling over the holidays. It was a mistake and I apologize. I left on a personally paid trip. Nobody cares who paid. Well, we care if the government paid for it, but nobody, you don't not get off the hook because you paid for it, buddy. That ain't how it works. He says, I'm making arrangements to return to Ontario immediately. Well, maybe that's because his boss, Ontario Premier Doug Ford, had this to say. This is like, go to your room and don't come out until you're ready. Doug Ford says, can you imagine the Premier saying this to the finance minister? At a time when every Ontarian's been asked to make sacrifices, I am extremely disappointed in Minister Phillips and his decision to travel abroad. Hey, folks, if Doug Ford's saying this publicly, imagine how pissed he is behind the scenes. He says, I've let the minister know his decision to travel is completely unacceptable and that it will not be tolerated again. I have also told the minister I need him back in the country immediately. Buddy is getting bitch slapped publicly. Now, this is how people are responding. This, uh, by the way, the story expanding. Eric Denhoff is a former deputy minister uh, in Alberta and BC. The guy understands the mechanics of politics. He says, the ruling elites... From Ontario's finance minister to Alberta chiefs of staff, press secretaries for that matter, and Quebec as well are eating cake on foreign holidays while their constituents suffer, sacrifice, and die. Pontificating hypocrites telling us to stay home while they jet around the world. Uh, there's this. It touched down in Alberta as well. Independent media outlet The Breakdown pointing out that education, Ministry of Education press secretary Michael Forian and... His partner, by the way, also an Alberta legislature staffer, really took it to heart, says the breakdown. There they are on a Hawaiian island after advising Albertans to stay at home. And of course, the Toronto Sun with this, wondering where the finance minister is. Where's Rotto? If you're a politician and you wind up on an illustrated front page like that, that's not good news for you. And speaking of vaccines, the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID vaccine has been approved in the United Kingdom, which would indicate that here in Canada and the United States, we may see that approved uh, soon as well. That would be the third vaccine. Keep in mind, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine was first. The Moderna 
a vaccine second. They're looking into whether or not that can be distributed as a one-shot as opposed to a two-shot dispersal here in Canada. And of course, now the Oxford AstraZeneca COVID vaccine approved in the United Kingdom. Let's get to our next guest. Uh, this guy, uh, I, I've had an opportunity to check in with Kevin Van Tiggum, uh a number of times, and I'm always impressed with his perspectives. It's because he understands issues as a conservationist. He understands issues as an author. And as part of his extensive career journey, he served as the superintendent of Banff National Park. So if you want to talk to somebody that's been in a position of understanding the issues, Kevin Van Tiggum is your guy. Uh, The author of a column in Alberta Views magazine. Kevin, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Real Talk. A good morning and thanks for being here. Thanks, Ryan. It's good to see you again. Now, we just had a conversation with Andrew Nikiforic, and and, and I'll acknowledge this is not what we've asked to speak with you about. I wanted to talk to you about Alberta parks and policies and ownerships and management, but do you have insight on uh, the Alberta government rescinding its coal policy and and allowing for strip mining on the eastern slope of the Rockies? I have to imagine the story is on your radar. Uh, Well, I think that Andrew covered it very well. it's a, it's 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 a piece of the other story that you wanted to talk to me about because it goes to the way in which we're currently being governed. Um, it's very interesting that the coal policy was rescinded without any consultation with Albertans, but basically on a re, as a result of uh, lobbying by Robin Campbell, who is a former Tory insider. It's it's like we're back to the back to what we thought we got rid of in 2012, which is government by insiders who don't take the time to do their homework, don't take the time to consult with those of us who who they are in place to uh, serve, but just talk to each other and uh, and come up with good ideas uh, that, that make sense to them because they haven't talked to anybody else. So um, what we're seeing is this, this pattern now of the government making big decisions that relate to our environment, to the our home place, the places that we care about and have, and many of us have invested like whole lifetimes trying to uh, trying to sustain. Uh, they're making decisions without any public consultation. Without, with, with, um, it's the kind of arrogance that came in to this province in the years after the Lougheed years and that we thought we'd gotten rid of, but apparently we have not. And um, it, it, it's unfortunate because now um, we get involved in these messy struggles, these messy issues. You know, it was the parks issue. You know, uh, why did Albertans have to go to the wall to save their parks? And now we're going to have to go to the wall to save our mountains from strip mines. You know, we're talking about, from a strip mining point of view, we're talking about an area that, we're talking about 10 Edmontons uh, potentially are going to be opened up in the, in, uh, as, as open pit mines up and down the eastern slopes. That makes the park issue pale in comparison. But they are all part of a piece, which is that uh, we, we don't seem to have a government that respects our environment. We don't seem to have a government that respects us. And so we're, we're, we're constantly being pushed back against the wall, fighting fights that were won like 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Kevin, it's, it's uh, to me, it, it just the optics of the situation are mind blowing, especially when Uh, And I hope people will understand the point I'm getting at here. I'm not advocating for environmental destruction um, or, you know, or taking advantage of our environment for, for, for pure profit. But you can at least to a certain degree justify environmental impact if there's a huge financial boon, at least we have in past with the information we had available at the time. In this circumstance, it doesn't even sound like it's worth it and to speak from a layperson's perspective it almost seems to me to be if you wanted to if you were speaking anecdotally if you were joking around with someone and you wanted to describe someone that really 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 didn't give a rip about the environment you might say he's the type of person that would allow for strip mining in the rocky mountains it almost sounds like the most extreme example that you could come up with it's it, it is it is it is seriously bizarre and and it's i think andrew touched on this as well there's a really sad irony here uh if there's one thing we saw in the last you know several months of pandemic uh disruption uh that sort of uh accentuated something that a trend that we were already seeing 
It's people reconnecting with their environment. Like there, there's this, Albertans really know who they are because they know where they are. And this is a wonderful province with beautiful places out there. And we really saw that this year where, where you couldn't even get parking in Kananaskis in many parts of the West Country, uh, west of Edmonton and, and Red Deer. You couldn't find a place to park, to go hiking. You couldn't find a place, you know, you couldn't find a, 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 a pool to fish in where you could be alone because there were so many people out there enjoying nature. Every single one of those people was spending money. They were spending money on gas. They were spending money on lodgings. They were spending money on beer. Uh, and basically, they were feeding the Alberta economy because when you spend money on those things, you're employing people. Uh, we, I, I spent my whole working life in the national parks. Canada's national parks, the, the, the old national parks along the, the eastern slopes of the Rockies, generate more for this province economically than oil and gas. At, at, at the present time, it certainly wasn't the case in the 70s. Yeah. Um, so, so these are real industries that have real economic benefit. Same token, ranching, uh, cattle production, one of the oldest industries, industries, industries we have in this province. And it's, ex it's existed in this, in, in this province for over a century without leaving any negative impacts. I mean, there's management issues around ca cows, but ranches have got most, most of the best ranchers have got that stuff figured out. So we've got a sustainable economy, sustainable pieces of the economy, all of which are threatened by these stupid ideas that the current government is coming up with because they haven't taken the time to do their homework and they haven't taken their time to consult with those of us who they have been elected to serve. You know, Kevin, one of the it, things... It seems bizarre to me, yeah. Uh, uh, how is a, a strip mine that's disrupted an entire watershed and is leaking toxins into the what water remains, uh, you know, has taken the tops off our scenic mountains and, and, and wiped out wildlife habitat and fish habitat? How is that an improvement? over what we have right now that's still working when other things aren't. You know, I, I'd rather talk to you about the environmental impacts of things, but I, but, but I, I have to infuse a little bit of political commentary into this. Because let me also say that, you know, when it comes to the next election, and I know that it feels like a long time away and politicians will never say this publicly, but I but I believe that politicians uh, have a sense that in a four year mandate, they can probably do pretty much whatever they want from month six all the way up to the third year. And then the final year, the job is, is to help people forget about all the dumb things that they did the two years previous. They, 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 they get back into the good graces. They make big funding announcements. They support the seniors. They reach out and do blue pickup truck tours through rural Alberta to get everybody back on their side. But the play here is curious for me for a conservative government to be alienating many of the rural bases of support i mean you've got some ranchers andrew nikifork has spoken to many of them and they've gone on the record with other media outlets the globe post media i've seen a lot of outlets cbc talking to them uh, these people are really really ticked off so if there's not an economic boon if there's a big environmental risk and if there's a huge political risk to me this seems like a three for three bonehead move yeah i i i don't i don't understand you know the political strategy behind this. I, it's it's it, it's lost on me. I I certainly know there's a ton of buyers' regret out there. There's an awful lot of people who thought they were voting for um, a government that would feel and 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 act and look like uh, the golden days of the old progressive conservatives, the the, the, the Peter Lawley days. But uh, they seem to have gotten something much farther to the right and really entrenched in those old insider politics that we got so tired of. Uh, in the uh, in the in the last decade, so I, I I don't understand the logic of it, and and I don't know where they're going to come up with their goodie bag in the last year because uh, um, I don't see anything that they're doing that's producing money or jobs for this province. So, you know, how do you hand out goodies? You know, well, and um, and you you remember? I mean, Kevin, you remember? Everybody watching or listening to this will remember the 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 evisceration. Uh, that then Environment and Parks Minister Shannon Phillips was was subject to as part of the NDP government's initiative to get that Bighorn 
park off and running. And, and, and everybody, I think, wondered when when the UCP, uh, pardon me, at that time, uh, when the Conservative Party in official opposition um, and then the UCP started really railroading Minister Phillips and started really backing these these citizen groups in that part of the province, in, in, the, in the southwestern part of Alberta, and started, and, and, and I mean, to the point where Minister Phillips claimed uh, that she had had to call the RCMP, they had to stop consultation sessions because she said she was receiving threats on this. I mean, this is the same part of the province that we're talking about. And the assertion at the time was that the NDP was not doing adequate consultation on rolling out this new park. Now, right? Now there's no consultation. We're talking about the same footprint of the province, but now there's no consultation on strip mining it for coal. Like, could you come up with a bigger difference in storylines, more ground in between them if you tried? Yeah, it is it is pretty bizarre and it's funny because uh i spent you know the four years pre- previous to the last uh election uh being consulted with i i was i was uh put on advisory boards i participated in stakeholder meetings i i know i i i was tired of being consulted with uh and then the criticism going into the into the last election was that um the ndp were imposing these parks on albertans without consulting with us well, they were consulting with us. They just weren't necessarily, you know, uh, able to make everybody happy. And, and and certainly some of the people that are used to freewheeling uh, un, unmanaged recreation were concerned. But um, it wasn't that they weren't consulted with. It's just that they didn't get what they wanted. And then we get a new government that comes in, you know, riding that wave and actually feeding that wave. And what do they do? They don't consult. So, yeah, it's 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 politics is weird. Eh? I, I, I don't I, I don't understand. Um, I, I must say that, uh, you know, that whole Bighorn Country thing, um, it got very controversial, it got very ugly, um, but I bet you an awful lot of people are looking back now saying, geez, you know, that was the right way to go because last year in the West Country, we had landscape damage like we'd never seen before. We had crowding, we had uh, littering problems, wildlife uh, conflict problems, and now, of course, we've also got these coal mine proposals going in. Um, Bighorn Country looks starts to look like kind of visionary stuff when you look at what we're dealing with now in the absence of it um you can't go back but you can go forward so uh, you know it, it will be really interesting to see where we go over the next couple of years and what comes out of the next election um i think we've sort of saved our parks um they're <laughs> a little me, bit cagey about how they communicate like, I, that stuff I, 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 we've sort of saved our parks yeah. and we have not saved our, our our mountains yet yeah i'm not i'm not laughing i i'm I, as they say uh, I'm laughing so I don't cry, Kevin. Um, at, at your at your assertion that you think we might have saved our parks, I'll tell you this: as I've been walking my dog uh, over the past several months, I've noticed more and more of these election style lawn signs popping up. The green and white ones that say "Defend Alberta Parks." Everybody's seen them. Defend AB Parks. Uh, the official opposition and some citizens are claiming that their campaign worked to get the Alberta government to walk back its plan to sell off parks the government's line the whole time has been hey we're not talking about selling any parks can you cut through the bullshit kevin and bring us up to speed on what's actually going on yeah. well the, the government uh le- g- leaped forward in the spring with an announcement that they were going to close decommission uh, a number of parks uh, smaller parks recreational area size parks and sell some of them and that probably blew up in their faces so they deleted that from their web pages and their and their media releases and started saying well no we're going to look for partnerships and they sort of changed their story several times um i don't know who gives them advice they you know they could have simply said we heard you and we're changing course but they they didn't have the smarts to do that they just kept, kept on coming up with a different story as if nobody saves old press releases and nobody actually thinks in the province so the most recent thing, and it's because of those signs, they hate those signs, uh, brilliant campaign by, by Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. I, I got to hand it to them. That, that one was great and, and, and great uptake by Albertans who really care about this stuff. So they hate those signs. They came up finally with a message saying, no, 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 um, all the parks that we listed in budget, the last budget, uh, are we found partnerships for them. Uh, they did this sort of like a shell game. Uh, most of those partnerships already existed. A couple of ones are, are new, like there's a track setting one in Kananaskis. And, um, and so um, they're going to stay protected and they're going to stay parks. And then they had a list and the list left out all of the recreation areas in the coal mining area, which is kind of cute. 
so uh, that's what I say. We, we, we don't know where we are because they keep changing their story and they never come clean with us. But it looks like they've heard enough and they are sick enough of those signs and they realize that they're losing some of the people that voted for them, uh, that they are moving back on that. But at the same time, what I think what a lot of people don't realize is that they are rewriting Alberta's park and public lands legislation. Uh, they're under a lot of pressure from their supporters, primarily people that like unmanaged recreation. Uh, and um, there's another shoe that's going to drop here. And I think we really need to keep an eye on this, this, this legislative process that they're doing, where they're going to keep them all parks, but what kind of parks are we going to have? Are we going to have them uh, riddled with off-road vehicle trails? Are we going to have them uh, opened up to all sorts of commercial activities? We don't know because it's still the same people, but now they're just gonna change the rule book. And so uh, how will they consult with us on uh, changes to park legislation? History to date would suggest they're not gonna consult with us very much. They're gonna talk to the people that they, uh, that, that, that they like hanging out with, their insiders. Um, but we better make darn sure they consult with us because those are our parks, those are our public lands, and we have a huge stake in their future. I want to quote from Bob Weber, his story in the Canadian press uh, this week. Uh, the Alberta government says no parks to close after partnerships announced. And 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 he quotes, he writes, Nixon, uh, that's Alberta Environment and Parks Minister Jason Nixon, maintained Alberta's current park system was unaffordable, uh, but was unable to say how much money the changes would save then. And here's the key. Freedom of information documents, thank you to journalists on these stories like Bob, freedom of information documents surfaced that showed Minister Nixon had ignored advice from his own staff to begin public consultations. It's always the deputy ministers and and, and the nonpartisan staffers that really get screwed in these things because they've been around through different governments. They understand the importance of things like consultation. Uh, the minister ignoring advice from his own staff to begin consultations. The documents also suggested that these partnerships will cost the government more, not less. So we're not even going to save money. So so it begs, Kevin, let me ask you this, and, and, and I'll ask it candidly, uh, maybe to elicit a laugh, but I'm being serious. If you were to, if, if you were to throw out a, a conspiracy, if you say, hey, listen, I can't prove this, but here's what I'm really concerned about. I mean, these things have happened before. You sit there and you know what this stinks like to me? This stinks like this. And then six months later or a year later, it happens. What are you most worried about here? What would be your biggest fear? Well, I, my biggest fear would essentially be the the, the fear of privatization. The, the idea that somehow all these things which are public benefits, public services provided to the public uh, and, and funded by the public, will become private enterprises and, 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 and will become profit centers for small companies that like to donate to the United Conservative Party. Um, the thing, I, I, I wouldn't say I've got a conspiracy theory. My, my God, there's lots of those out there if you want one. Um, but uh, I've certainly got, um, based on observation, I've come to the conclusion that, um, that we've got some real fights, those of us who love Alberta and love Alberta's well, well places ahead of us for the next couple of years at least, because we have a government that doesn't actually think. They, they, they're not, they're, they, they don't make strategic policy decisions. They don't consult. They're ideologically driven. It's a highly ideological government. And their ideology is one that says, let the market make all the decisions. The less government we have, the better. Well, okay, that's, that's an interesting ideology. Uh, it, it has some, um, uh, I guess, uh, an, uh, um, theoretical uh, foundations that, that, that are appealing to certain people. The truth is we'll always need government. Uh, that's why we form democracies. And government will always need to be properly financed. And the government exists to serve the public interest. There are certain things that are in the public interest that are not businesses. And parks are one of those things. Parks are protected areas. We, we need them for our, our spiritual health. We need them for our mental and physical health. We need them for the biological diversity that they protect. Uh, these are all, th th this is a public trust the government manages on our behalf. And to privatize it, to turn it into a whole bunch of little enterprises means that uh, uh, the, the dominant things driving decisions related to that land cease to be sustainability and become short-term profit. And we've seen that happen before. Uh, I've certainly, 
uh, had experience with uh, small um, private enterprises in in national parks. Um, once you change the once once you put credit cards and credit card processing in front of the public interest, the public interest gets left in the dust real quick. Kevin, uh, in closing, uh, for now. Uh, the folks that have the defend Alberta parks lawn signs up and, and the folks that are feeling motivated, uh, you know, Kathy B is watching right now. She's, she's talking about more about the strip mining. Uh, she says, this makes me so mad. She's on her hashtag real talk RJ. She says, I hope every listener of real talk is feeling the same way. I, I, Kathy says our water supply should always be protected, especially in the Eastern slopes for, for viewers and listeners like Kathy, for people that have the lawn, can, can we take the lawn signs down now? Is, is, is the fight finished or, or, or what's to come? Give us a peek into 2021 and what you think the, the world of environmental advocacy in Western Canada. And in this context in Alberta looks like what's the biggest fight ahead. Certainly for Alberta, the defining environmental issue of this decade will be coal strip mining in the Rocky Mountains. Mm. There's so much hangs on that. Our, we, have, we have our uh, threatened species like, like West Slope, Cutthroat, Trout and Bull Trout, uh, White Bark Pine. We have uh, some of our best hunting and hiking and fishing habitats for, for people. And most critically, we have water supply. Those landscapes trap snow and water, put it into groundwater and release it slowly into the creeks and that is our water supply. The water in the North Saskatchewan River, the water in the Bow River, it doesn't appear magically, it comes out of those landscapes. Um, so this is probably the biggest issue because I think that um, the government is gonna be much more defensive in trying to protect this. It's another bad decision, but they, they've, they've lost face on the parks issue. They're gonna be dug in deeper. Um, I would really encourage everybody to, to think with, to your heart remember this is our home place we love this place this is our home uh we need to fight for our home and listen to the what you hear from the government and what you hear from the from the interest groups and listen for people that are speaking from a place of love versus people that are speaking from a place of of of, of hard narrow uh um sort of um, consumptive point of view um we will have as good and as beautiful a future as we're prepared to fight for. Unfortunately, citizenship is not a passive enterprise. You don't just vote and then sit down and count on, everything's, uh, on everything to be fine. We need to be involved. We need those signs up right next to them. We need to have, say, the Eastern Slopes from strip mining signs. And we need to keep this government accountable for serving all of us as opposed to serving their insider friends. You've been able to see that that book over his shoulder, Bears Without Fear. It's one of the many books authored by Kevin Van Tiggum, also The Homeward Wolf, Heartwater, Sources of the Bow River, Wild Roses Are Worth It, Alberta Reconsidered, and of course, his column in Alberta Views magazine, This Land. He's the former superintendent of Banff National Park. Kevin Van Tiggum, thank you for this. We appreciate your straight facts, and we wish you and yours a very happy new year. Thank you, Ryan. It's bound to be better than the last one, right? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> knock on wood, buddy. Thanks, Kevin. We'll talk to you again soon. Uh, you can let me know what you think about what you've just heard from Kevin. Uh, we're keeping an eye on, on the YouTube uh, comments here, our, our live stream. And uh, this, I mean, there, there's a theme here. Uh, right to Beaver says, hey, listen, if you truly believe in, in what you're hearing here from these guests, you must help and support indigenous land defenders. It says there are the very same issues in northern BC, right? Uh, Wigwith says, hey, you got to keep putting up signs. You've got to keep sending letters, right? And uh, is it uh, some R&D guy uh, or some random guy rather watching this morning on YouTube says this is our job as citizens to hold our government accountable. Complacency is what led us hear that from some random guy keep the comments coming we're keeping an eye as well on our on our hashtag that's real talk rj uh in just a moment just a couple of moments we're going to check in with uh, brandy morin brandy does an amazing job as a, a journalist in a number of different publications she's got a feature piece coming up in the toronto star uh that's i think as far as i understand we'll double check with her i'm pretty sure it's being released tomorrow it's being released on on new year's eve day the top 
20 indigenous news stories of 2020. She's going to tee up a few of those for us. Before we get to Brandy, let's recognize a couple of the other sponsors that have joined us on this journey as Real Talk Builders. It includes the team at Westworld Computers. Daryl and his team there have been in business, you know, just off Mayfield Road there in, in North Edmonton for more than 40 years years covering you whether it's a hey the new iphone that you need you want to get your hands on you saw the photos that other people are taking with their iphones and you're you're realizing how old and lousy yours is it's okay to have iphone envy they can get you sorted out whether you're replacing your macbook pro like my buddy magoo is doing today he's got to run his business he can't sit around and wait for his computer issues to sort themselves out so he's on his way to westworld computers today and so should you be whether it's a sales or service concern don't head into the mall and go through that annoying appointment process to talk to some staffer at that big brand Apple store. Go to Westworld Computers, locally owned and operated for more than 40 years. We're also breathing easy here in the Real Talk studio. Thanks to the team at Clean Air Club, we asked them to audit our space because that's what they do. They come in and they make sure that the air that you're breathing is as clean and healthy as possible. So they offered us a custom solution and they want to remind you that the biggest step that you can take for your own peace of mind, your own clean air, is your furnace filter. So that's what they're in the business of. You need to figure out, just read on the side of your furnace filter what the size is. You go to cleanairclub.ca, you sign up, they do all the rest. You don't even have to leave the house. They'll drop off your new filters, they'll keep you on a schedule. Of course, all of this allows you to save money and allow your family to breathe easier. Our thanks to the team at Clean Air Club for their support. Well, I have been impressed with Brandy Morhan's work for years. I remember the first time I spoke with her, she has courageously covered issues of consequence to Canadians. And in particular, her focus on Indigenous stories has earned her great acclaim across the country. She's an award-winning Cree Mohawk French journalist based out of Alberta. Her work, you may have read it, in The Guardian, The New York Times, Al Jazeera English, CBC Indigenous, El Canada, and Vice, among others. She's making her Real Talk debut this morning. Brandy, welcome to the show, and thank you for making time for us. Tanse Ryan, it's good to see you. Thank you for having me. So you have you have a big piece, and it sounds this sounds to me like the type of piece that you invest hours and hours into coming out in tomorrow's <laughs> Toronto Star, correct? New Year's Eve, the top 20 Indigenous stories of 2020. Uh, take us into this. Where, where did this all begin for you? Well, actually, the editor of the Toronto Star approached me mm. to do a year-end kind of roundup piece. I've been doing opt-ed analysis for them now regularly. I'm a regular contributor to that. So um, I, it was 2020, and I thought, well, I'll round up you know, the top uh, 20 stories that made the headlines across the nation. And yes, there was a heck of a whole lot of work than I thought put into this, but it's good. It's good to uh, document this, to look back and learn from um, this crazy tumultuous year that we've had. Brandy, it feels, I mean, we're, we're going to talk about, I, I've asked you to identify, you know, five or six of the stories that we can get into. Obviously, we want folks to check out your full story. There's no way we'd have time to cover all 20 right now, but but I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, one of the stories that you passed along could, could arguably, I think, be the story of the year with implications to Indigenous Canadians, but it feels like it was 10 years ago, considering the pandemic and everything else that's occurred, but it wasn't. It was, it was less than a year ago that that railways were blockaded. The Canadians were trying to educate themselves on the differences between elected chiefs and hereditary chiefs. All of this part of that Wet'suwet'en showdown. Take us into this story. Yes, so uh, this is a a conflict that has been going on uh, between the uh, hereditary Wet'suwet'en leadership and the coastal gas link pipeline. you know, there is a dispute between who owns title to the land, which was granted to the Wet'suwet'en peoples by the Dalgamuth uh, case, Supreme Court case, case in BC. However, it was never made clear uh, the uh, the outlines of uh, the, the titles to that land. It was sitting there for 20 years until uh, this conflict started to arise. So, uh, 
for the second time, uh, first arrests were made in 2019. For the second time in 2020, Coastal Gathlink obtained an abjunction against uh, land defenders, indigenous land defenders there uh, to get them out of the way to get their pipeline built. So the RCMP went in, raided Wet'suwet'en checkpoints and a healing camp there. And it uh, caused uh, an, you know, an uproar across the country with their allies, with other indigenous land defenders and saw Canada uh, you know, come under weeks of blockades and railway shutdowns, highway shutdowns. Um, it was very, very impactful. Uh, Justin Trudeau was under a lot of pressure to, you know, take action to, you know, bring the blockades down, which uh, he finally relented. He was a little bit, um, I guess, uh, reluctant to do that because of his commitments to reconciliation. Um, but after enough presser, pre pressure, he caused for the blockades to come down. The RCMP moved in across country and made uh, arrests. Um, you know, in uh, Mohawk territories and other areas, including, well, I don't think any official arrests were made here in Alberta, but there were a couple of blockades that were taken down pretty swiftly. So, yeah, you uh, know, eventually. Brent, one, one, uh, of the, one of the things that, that really jumped out at me on this was it, it seemed like, and you, and you referenced the prime minister, um, obviously several Canadian premiers had comments on this. Uh, some business leaders had comments on this, uh, in Alberta in particular, we saw citizen action, um, which I think, yeah. I, I think created some tension be because people wondered, um, you know, as, as, as first of all, you have the railway blockade and then you have people roaring in also private citizens, um, you know, dismantling that in front of the, the demonstrators and it all, it, I, I mean, situations like that, all it takes is you know, we've seen it before, right? All it takes is one person throwing a punch or one person doing something and then all hell breaks loose. And the next thing you know, somebody gets killed. And we've seen this before. Yeah. It, it struck me as though leaders and, and I'm and I'm and I'm saying like across political corporate, uh, you know, lines um, didn't necessarily want to take a position on this. Everybody else wanted someone else to manage it, right? Like I remember some some police officers saying, hey, this is CN's uh, role. CN should be enforcing this. And CN saying law enforcement should be here. And, and people talking about the jurisdictional political uh, elements. In other words, this is a provincial deal or this is a federal deal. Nobody seemed to want to get in the way of this one. Absolutely Nobody really wanted to take responsibility, but ultimately it was Prime Minister Trudeau who, as we seen on his announcement nationwide to let the blockades come down, the police forces took that as a signal and they moved in that day to, uh, you know, take blood, take action across Canada. Um, uh, ultimately, uh, federal ministers, uh, we have Minister of Northern, or uh, Indigenous and Crown Relations, Caroline Bennett, um, and the provincial representation representatives of BC that ended up meeting, um, having an emergency meeting with the Wet'suwet'en hereditary uh, chiefs, which was, um, you know, highly publicized. It was over several days. They did come to an agreement that was eventually ratified with the Wet'suwet'en people. However, it did not deal with the current conflict. So it dealt with previous, um, you know, the Dalgamuth case and um, identifying, you know, uh, the, the land title uh, in that area. So this is an ongoing conflict. Um, even though COVID-19 pandemic moved in, uh, the pipeline has been in full construction there. There's been multiple breakouts uh, with the workers uh, inside the camps that they're working at. Um, and the Wet'suwet'en uh, hereditary leaders and land defenders are you know, very concerned and they're still standing to protect their lands. Uh, a story that, uh, like you said, Brandy, it's so easy to see these stories drop out of the headlines as uh, as other things happen. Um, you know, I mean, geez, you know, you look back on this year, this really doesn't have anything to do, I say that respectfully, nothing to do with what you and I are talking about. But we look at the the Canadians that perished, nearly 60 of them, on that Ukrainian Airlines flight that was shot down over Tehran. I mean, you take a look at so many of the stories that happened in early 2020 that became overshadowed by this global pandemic. It doesn't mean they're not still 
stories. It doesn't mean they're yeah. not still impacting people, which is why what you're doing is so valuable. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, on the other side of the country. Let's talk about uh, on, on the eastern shores of Canada. Let's talk about Nova Scotia and, and lobster mm. fishermen. This is this is a story that uh, were it not for the pandemic again, this is one that would have led the headlines for potentially weeks yeah, absolutely. So we have Mi'kmaq uh, uh, and uh, fishermen there in uh, Nova Scotia that were exercising their treaty right to fish uh, out of season. And we had um, non-Indigenous fishermen that became outraged and uh, started, uh, you know, uh, becoming extremely violent towards the Mi'kmaq fishermen. Um, and RCMP stood back and watched as uh, Mi'kmaq, or sorry, non-Indigenous fishermen surrounded uh, Mi'kmaq uh, lobster processing plants, uh, set a van on fire. There were, uh, you know, racial insults and threats made. And this was going on for a number of weeks. Um, finally, um, Canada uh, brought in uh, extra RCMP reinforcements and uh, were actually sent in to protect these Mi'kmaq fishermen. It was really, really ugly. Uh, it's still, you know, ongoing. There was weeks and weeks of con conflict. But um, on December 11th, the Nova Scotia RCMP, they arrested 21 people uh, in relation to the violent acts at the Lobster Pound. So I guess, you know, there is some justice, which is rare to happen in Indian country when these type of conflicts come about. Uh, but again, it, it, it really speaks to so many of the tensions between Native and non-Native uh, citizens here in this country and how easily that can, you know, explode. And we are lucky no one was seriously hurt. There was actually um, a man, a non-Indigenous man who was actually hospitalized from uh, the fire incident. Brandy, I uh, I don't know. Is there any do you, is there any relation between you and Treaty Six Grand Chief Billy Morin by any chance? No, there isn't. No, but I know him. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a really compelling guy. Uh, a, a young yes, a young chief. As a matter of fact, the youngest chief in the history of Enoch Cree Nation. And uh, we had a, a wonderful conversation with him the very first week we were on the air. And he referenced this story with, with the Mi'kmaq uh, people and, and said one of the things. We talked about the Wet'suwet'en blockades uh, or the blockades across Canada related to the Wet'suwet'en uh, controversy. And, and and he kind of, he joked, but if you know uh, Chief Morin, he's only uh, half joking. He joked that maybe it was just time for Canada's Indigenous peoples to buy the railroad. And he said that if you take a look at how this Mi'kmaq story played out, a billion dollar deal. I want to make sure that I get this right, but but a billion dollar deal uh, where uh, uh, leaders of the member two and Miapukik First Nations, uh, both Mi'kmaq communities, reached an agreement to buy Clearwater Seafoods yeah. based out of Nova Scotia for a billion dollars. He said that seemed to solve the issue there. Maybe we just need to buy the railway. But that but but that no was doubt. what it what an interesting development in that story when it came to ownership of of clearwater seafoods and now the the guys that were attacking them are going to be working for <laughs> the Mi'kmaq fishing fishermen how ironic is that no kidding however that is you know a great development but i know that there are uh uh Mi'kmaq people there that are still exercising the right to fish that are still concerned with their safety they're still encountering you know racism and threats of violence so um you know, that, again, is an ongoing uh, situation there. So. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, far from resolved. Uh, Brandy Morin is our guest, uh, uh, a journalist whose who piece, an extended feature piece, will be published in the Toronto Star tomorrow, the top 20 Indigenous stories in Canada of 2020. Brandy, back in just a moment, wanted to remind those of you at home that Park Power is powering our Real Talk RJ hashtag each and every show. We're keeping an eye on that right now. Very curious for your take on, on what you're hearing right now. We're still getting a ton of comments on stream strip mining on the eastern slopes of the Canadian Rockies from Tony and Lorne and, and Lisa. Keep those coming. Irene, it's great to hear from you. You know, Park Power's in the internet, natural gas, and electricity game. They have been for coming up on 10 years now, proudly owned and based out of Alberta. So are their call centers, their customer service centers. They profit share with, with local charities here. 
Now, here's the cool thing. Park Power has just rolled out a promo code for Real Talk audience members, whether we're talking business or residential. If you take your business to Park Power right now at parkpower.ca and use the promo code 2021-REALTALK, 2021-REALTALK, no questions asked, you're going to receive $70 off your first bill. 70 bucks off your first bill for using that promo code 2021-REALTALK at parkpower.ca. We're also grateful for the support, the ongoing support of Alta Moving and Storage. This is the team that across the province right now has these moving style, the pod style containers, you know, the ones that everybody's using for moving these days. Now, here they are in the province helping Albertans solve the day-to-day dilemma of how do we make moving less stressful. You know, research shows that moving is like one of the most stressful things you're going to do in your entire life. Give them a call or visit their website. You can link to it, altastorage.ca, or under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. And, of course, that's where you can book those pod-style moving containers. You can get those frog box, the eco-friendly moving boxes. And if you need it, you can inquire about their short or longer-term storage. So they've got you covered across the spectrum when it comes to pulling the stress out of moving, whether you're upsizing, downsizing, or renovating. They've got you figured out at Alta Moving and Storage. Brandi Morin is our guest. Her piece runs tomorrow in the Toronto Star. So we've talked about uh, the Wet'suwet'en. We've talked about the Mi'kmaq. Let's take a look at another one of the stories, Brandi, that you're covering. These We've asked you to select a few of the top 20 stories. Take us into 1492 Land Back Lane. Yes, so this is another... um indigenous land uh, conflict. Uh, This takes us to six nations, um, land defenders uh, in just outside of Caledonia, Ontario. Uh, They set up uh, an encampment called 1492 Land Back Lane. So basically they were reclaiming land that they say belongs to the Haudenosaunee as per per the Halamant Treaty uh, of 1912 that was made between them and the government of Canada, which outlined attractive land for them. Um, Ultimately, it ended up exchanging hands and being sold nowadays to a land developer, Fox State's development and being developed into a residential area. So uh, these uh, Haudenosaunee land defenders stepped in and said, no, this ain't gonna happen. They set up camp there. So an injunction, of course, was obtained by the uh, development uh, uh, company and the Ontario Provincial Police moved in to enforce that injunction. So there has been, again, a major conflict, uh, violence that has erupted out of there. We've seen the OPP um, fire, you know, rubber bullets. We've seen uh, land defenders uh, light, uh, you know, piles of uh, tires on fire to blockade the area. We've seen journalists uh, and research is being arrested and charged, uh, which is very unprecedented here in this country uh, for reporting on site. Um, there was a permanent injunction that was just uh, uh, granted to the development company in October uh, by the judge. So again, uh, these the OPP are, are you know, treading uh, I don't know if they're treading lightly or, you know, what exactly they're doing to move in to remove uh, these uh, Indigenous land title owners uh, from that area. But my question has always been, who are the people that are buying this land and who have made down payments to build homes there? And they must be aware of this conflict. What would make them want to move there and not pull out, given that this has made national headlines? Given that this is on the brink of another Oka crisis, where we uh, seen became deadly, you know, uh, in the early 1990s. So I've always been, you know, curious about that. Brandy, do you think that? Uh, and you you just referenced Oka. Um, that's you know sort of one of the very important stories in Canadian history when it comes to, I mean, when we have conversations about reconciliation, when we talk about land titles, when we talk about sovereignty, this is one of the recurring um, elements of our history. Um, 
th- all three of the stories that we've touched on so far, and there are many more. And again, your piece comes out tomorrow in the Toronto Star. You're going to feature 20 of the top stories. And I, and I bet you'll probably tell us you didn't cover them all. There's probably even more than that. But yeah. there's this recurring theme of land defense. Now, is it just because we have uh, Twitter and Instagram and and YouTube and, and information is more widely accessible and people can broadcast themselves just like we're doing right now? Um, or it, or it, are these recurring or are these happening more frequently? I mean, are we just hearing about it more or is this happening more frequently? What do you think? I definitely think it's a combination of everything that you just mentioned. Uh, We had um, a major movement in Indian country that uh, happened in uh, 2012, uh, Idle No No More movement. And it broke out across the country, uh, a grassroots movement to raise awareness about indigenous rights and to stand up against certain um, uh, legislation that was being passed in parliament. And the the creators of this movement utilize social media in uh, you know, such a profound way that we'd never really seen before. And I think the momentum of that movement has really carried on to today. So yes, people are tuned in and connected like never before. Uh, we're in, in such a different time where uh, we are more able to exercise our rights, I guess. Um, not as more able, but we are just, there's, people in Indian country are stepping in to that role because a lot of that uh, oppression is being, you know, lifted and and a lot of the awareness of our rights, you know, is coming to the forefront. So there have been movements like these that have been going on, you know, since this country was established, but again, they are becoming more frequent and they will become more and more frequent as time goes on. Brandy, one of the stories that you focus on in your piece that'll be out tomorrow is the relationship between Canadian law enforcement and Canada's Indigenous peoples. And there were several prominent uh, scenarios. I'm, I'm trying to pick the right word. I don't want to say, I mean, if you say incidents, it, it doesn't it doesn't quite show the respect in some circumstances to victims here, um, or in some cases to survivors. But but Take us into what you explore here in this context. Yes, definitely. So um, kind of around the time when uh, the world was reacting to the killing of George Floyd by uh, police officers in Minnesota, uh, we were witnessing a lot of uh, increased violence that made the headlines against Indigenous people here in Canada. Uh, It happens on a higher scale, um, more than any other race against indigenous peoples here in this country. But this year it seemed to coincide with what was happening regarding the racial tensions and and violence against police uh, worldwide. So in April, we seen Winnipeg police shoot and kill three indigenous uh, peoples, including a 16 year old girl named Aisha Hudson in a matter of 10 days. It was like this violent, indigenous targeted you know shooting spree then comes june and we see back-to-back shootings of as well of a 26 year old first nations woman named chantelle moore who was killed by police in new brunswick during a wellness check uh i think it was about a week later a man in his 40s a first nations man was also gunned down in new brunswick by police while he was visiting his pastor's home. So we were uh, seeing incidences like this, like boom, boom, boom across the country and reacting to it while the, you know, reacting to what's happening, you know, in the States with Black Lives Matter and all this talk of police violence, where one of the most prominent First Nations chiefs in Canada had enough, uh, you know, seen enough of, you know, the, the violence that was happening here and decided to speak out regarding something that happened to him in March, where uh, he was, uh, you know, tackled by a couple of officers in Fort McMurray, tackled to the ground over an expired license plate and, uh, you know, uh, beaten and arrested. Um, footage came out, uh, dash cam footage uh, came out uh, shortly after his announcement and um, his bloodied and bruised face made headlines across the world. Um, he was charged. Um, I think it was obstruction. Those charges were eventually dropped against him. Again, he uh, became an advocate for you know police violence. 
Yeah, Chief, the story of Chief Allen Adam uh, in 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 the Athabasca Fort Chip one area in the Fort McMurray area is is remarkable. Um, we don't have time, Brandy, right now to really explore it. And I'd rather, you know, quite frankly, I'd rather discuss it with Just him. So you know, I did an extensive piece on him with Al Jazeera oh. English. If you want to look it up, yeah, yeah. Uh, under so Brandy I mean, because because his. Um, well, well, let's let's get into it a little bit. I mean, you you did an extended long form piece on it. Like this guy has has in in dealing with some of the environmental impacts of of let me say energy harvesting uh, in that part of the world uh, in this part of the province here has has really faced. I mean, it's not been an easy road to hoe uh, for Chief Allen Adam. What did you learn when you spoke with him or when you covered on him with this feature piece in Al Jazeera English? Well, you know, it was one of the most difficult interviews I've ever had because when I went up there in June, you know, he's this tough guy. Um, you kind of, you know, never really know how to take him. Um, he's, you know, strong headed. He's extremely, uh, you know, smart. He, he knows what he's doing. But I uh, found out for the first time that he was a residential school survivor. So I had interviewed him many times on and off throughout the years but I did not know this. And he shared with me his experience about being a six year old kid and being raped multiple times in residential school. And it, uh, I actually broke down during our interview. And as he shared, you know, so much of the, the crap that he overcame throughout his years and then, you know, came into leadership, he pulls no punches. And, you know, that was all a part of, you know, what he does and, and, and how he walks today and how he deals with these multi-billion dollar energy companies. You know, at first he took a stance of um, complete opposition and was made, you know, famous by, you know, partnering with um, celebrities such as, you know, Neil Diamond and Leonardo DiCaprio and stuff to oppose development. And in recent years, he has switched tactics to, uh, you know, going to the table with these energy companies and um, really uh, defining the terms as to, you know, what he and his community need. So the guy's been through a lot. Like he even told me what they're invest. A lot of people think he sold out right in the energy industry that he went to the other side. He told me that his community are going to be refugees. They are going to have to pick up and leave because there's going to be nothing left. It's going to be completely destroyed by development there. So he's putting enough money away in order to pick the community up and move them away one day. Unbelievable. To see this violence, um, you know, come against this chief who is so strong headed. Uh, it was, it was shocking. It was, um, uh, I'm, I'm glad that he took a stand. He said that he was becoming a voice for people that don't have a voice. We know that this happens day in and day out. We know that our prison systems are overflowing with indigenous men and women. Considering uh, indigenous people make up approximately 5% of people in this country, I think the prison uh, population is getting close to half yeah. filled with indigenous people. So it's a pretty crazy situation across the board. Ryan, before we go, there is one other thing that I thought was important that I wanted to mention. Yeah. The National Enquirer into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls was released in June 2019. The Canadian government committed to releasing a national action plan in June of 2020. June has come and went, and they announced um, you know, a delay. They said that COVID-19 prevented them from uh, releasing a national action plan, when in fact they did have nine months prior to COVID-19 breaking out to get this much needed action plan developed and out there. So we have families and survivors of this um, national genocide that's happening that are waiting for the government to act. Of course, the government doesn't hold all the answers to this crisis and this issue, but it does play a big, big role. Uh, again, I wanted to bring attention to that. It's it's quite important uh, that we not, not forget that and that we acknowledge that this needs to be uh, taken care of and addressed. Brandy, you and, I, you and I could talk for three hours. I mean, you want to talk about where the federal <laughs> government's falling short uh, and failing to live up to promises. There are there are indigenous communities, there are reserves in Canada that have been under boil water advisories since the 80s. 
Like if if I, I remember as a kid, we went to Banff as a family and stayed in a hotel and Banff was under a boil water advisory because of beaver fever. I remember this as a kid. Mm. We, had to, we had to boil our water and then we put it outside to cool down so we could drink water. And we thought, what an inconvenience. What an inconvenience to be under a boil water advisory for an entire mm. weekend. There are communities that have been under boil water advisories for decades and the federal government has vowed to address this and yet has has yet to make any meaningful progress on, on that as well. I, I, let me leave you a, a moment to comment on that, Brandy, before we go. Yes. Yeah, so there there is one um, positive development in that area. We have the communities of uh, Grassy Narrows and another First, uh, First Nation nearby that have been de- dealing with water contamination since the 1950s due to a pulp mill plant that released loads and loads of mercury into their river system. Well, this year, the Canadian government finally gave multi, multi millions of dollars for them to to build a mercury treatment plant. Now we're, we're talking about people in this community that are living with mercury poisoning, living and dying, whole community members. It's so bad that they have to build a mercury treatment center right in the community. But the thing is, at least it's happening. So, uh, you know, that's a good thing. Yeah. Although I, 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 Thank you. I will say, and maybe my timeline's getting screwed up here, but I do remember um, individuals from that Grassy Narrows community interrupting a federal liberal fundraiser. That was when the, the prime minister famously uttered his his smug thank you for your donation. Uh, they had paid they had paid mm. the ticket price to get into the event to, to 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 make their protest known to the people. I wonder if that maybe fast tracked the investment into Grassy Narrows. I hate to be a cynic, but it's kind of why we're here. Um, Brandy, I am so grateful for your voice. This is far from the last time we're going to see you and hear you on this program. I'm very much looking forward to your piece tomorrow in the Toronto Star and I'll wish you a very happy new year thank you for this hi hi hi, hi. happy new year Ryan thank you you bet that's Brandy Morin uh give her a follow uh, on Twitter we link to our guest Twitter handles uh, each and every morning from mine at Ryan Jesperson uh she just does remarkable work and as you can tell uh very capable in covering uh a wide breadth of stories uh of, of concern and significance to a good number of Canadians um we're grateful for our partners here uh big and small so some of them are, are, are the big you know the car dealerships and the power providers and 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 uh you know the, the the food and restaurant services, and and then we've got the like the small businesses that have perfected the art of the hustle, and that includes Todd's Mechanical. Uh, we were big fans of of Todd at Todd's Mechanical from the moment that we met him. Just the, the way that he rolls, he says, "Listen, we're a small operation." He says, "We prioritize things like coming home every night and being with our families." So that's why Todd's not working in the oil patch anymore. That's where his career was. This is a guy that's been busting his butt and has a lot of pride in what he does, and he's proud to be Edmonton's best plumbing and heating expert just look at his online reviews they speak for themselves these are customer testimonials todd's not writing these ones and they speak for themselves like we said todd's mechanical is keeping edmontonians warm and dry edmonton and surrounding area taking care of your plumbing and heating needs plus why not get your furnace you know it's making that weird noise right now that's sketching you out you just know that any moment now it's gonna go furnaces conk out when it's minus 30 that's what they do And then you try to deal with it at minus 30 while your home is dropping temperature by the hour. Now, Todd will take your call at that time, but it's better you call him now at 780-499-7598. Maybe you don't need plumbing and heating help right now. You know you will at some point. Grab that pencil. Punch this into your phone. 780-499-7598. We're proud to be partnered with Todd's Mechanical. Now, the same goes with the team at Friesen Brothers. I don't have to tell you how excited I am. You can see my face explodes into a smile every time I talk about their 15th Alberta location, which is just getting set to open in South Edmonton, just off the Anthony Hendy, their Rabbit Hill location. Uh, If I owned another grocery store in South Edmonton, I'd be doing everything I can to maximize my profit over the next number of weeks because pretty soon, pretty soon, they're going to start to see more and more people head to Friesen Brothers. Uh, let me tell you about the, the Friesen Brothers experience. When you walk in the door for the first time, you go, oh, 
this is what everybody was talking about. And then you'll never go back. My wife drives out to Fort Saskatchewan to get her groceries at Friesen Brothers. That's how much she loves it. And every time we head west, we stop at either their Stony Plain or their Hinton location to get their famous sourdough cinnamon buns. Friesen Brothers, soon to be 15 locations, Alberta grown. Alberta owned. We're going to be talking to Edmonton Oilers former captain Andrew Ference in just a moment, but let's take a quick look at what's making headlines today. Well, everybody's talking about vaccines, the province of Alberta lagging behind a little bit. Yeah, early stages, but we know we're eager to see our frontline healthcare professionals and our most vulnerable, the elderly and long-term care centers inoculated as soon as possible. Alberta at this point so the government would be at 29,000 inoculations. We're at about 6,000 right now, so falling behind. But again, maybe we can ramp it up over the next few days. That, that doesn't mean the government's not being criticized, including this one from former Alberta Liberal Party leader David Kahn. He's a constitutional lawyer. <laughs> and I was joking earlier, the guy's been more vocal on social media since leaving politics than he ever was in politics. But he points out that uh, Shandro, Minister Shandro Kenny, Premier Jason Kenny, just confirmed only 7,000 Albertans have been immunized. Just a couple of weeks ago, he promised 29,000 would be vaccinated. That includes Alberta Health Services taking the stat holidays of Christmas off and not working at a flat out pace. Now, I'm sure there are other angles to be considered here, including healthcare worker burnout, but you would expect that we would have a plan that would accommodate a pedal to the metal approach on the vaccinations. And how can we ignore this story out of Ontario? Finance Minister Rod Phillips, this is a story literally leading the national news. Buddy shoots a bunch of videos to make it look like he's home on Christmas Eve and through the holidays. His staff releasing these videos. The truth is he's in St. Bart's. He flew down there with his family for a tropical getaway, even though the Ontario and federal governments have, have pleaded with people to limit non-essential international travel. Well, it's drawn the ire of many, and Nadine Youssef covering this for the Star says a statement from Minister Phillips says he was on a personal trip in, no, in St. Bart's. Well, no shit! He's making arrangements to return home immediately. Did somebody think he was down there on government business? Now, Premier Doug Ford is not happy about this. Check out this release. Keep in mind, this is a premier talking about his finance minister. He says, I am extremely disappointed in Minister Phillips. I have let him know his decision to travel is completely unacceptable. I have also told the minister I need him back in the country immediately. To get fired is what's going to happen. To get fired. This is why we need recall legislation. Constituents are ticked off about this. Now, it's not just the minister. Here's what other people are saying on social media. Now, you'll see this. This is a former deputy minister. Eric Denhoff has worked in politics at a high level in BC and Alberta. The ruling elites, he says, from Ontario's finance minister to Alberta political staffers and those in Quebec as well are eating cake on foreign holidays while their constituents suffer, sacrifice, and die, pontificating hypocrites, telling us to stay home while they jet around the world. It includes Alberta staffers, as mentioned, that are posting photos of their Hawaiian getaways like this one pushed out by independent media outlet The Breakdown. That's the press secretary for Alberta's Minister of Education. And then there's this story from the Toronto Sun. Not a story so much as a front page cover feature. If you're Rod Phillips, the finance minister, this is not the type of coverage that you are looking for. And stateside, it's worth noting that two of the police officers involved in the shooting death, the murder of Breonna Taylor, have been relieved of duty. They'll be fired from the Louisville Police Department. That's an update there on that story that I know made uh, much news earlier This year, members of the general public uh, across uh, international borders looking for what might pass as justice there. Well, this caught my attention uh, yesterday. I've been down to this ODR, this outdoor rink before. It's a beautiful spot in Edmonton, just north of the river. Like I'm talking a pitching wedge north of the river, uh, just off River Valley Road. It's the Victoria Oval. It's a beautiful rink where speed skaters can do their thing. Figure skaters in the middle are practicing their their triple lutzes. I mean, I've witnessed it firsthand. It's remarkable stuff and families can gather. But we're not really supposed to be gathering on masks right now. And if we are going to be out in public, we're supposed to be wearing masks, right? 
Well, Andrew Ference is a name that everybody knows in Edmonton. Any hockey fan knows Andrew Ference. I don't know if he's wearing his cup ring right now, but he won one with the Boston Bruins. He's played for the Pittsburgh Penguins. See, this is the difference between Furnuckle and me. If I had a cup ring, I'd wear it everywhere. Pittsburgh Penguins, Calgary Flames, and of course, wore the C for the Edmonton Oilers. Welcome to the show, man. It's great to have you here. Just well, it's nice to be here, bud. I'm it's, really happy for you. I've been listening a lot, so uh, I'm really proud of you. It's you're doing a good thing. Well, thank you. I I really appreciate that. So 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 you go to you want to strap on the blades last night? Is that it? Were you out with your family? You decided to to hit Victoria Oval. What was the situation that led to your your venting last night? Uh, well, I, you know, I think it's a culmination of things, right? But I think you know, like uh, like a lot of families, I think that you know we're kind of uh, in the middle, like a lot of people. We're not eliminating every single risk in our lives, um, you know, where we're not stepping out of the house and, and doing absolutely nothing. Um, I think like a lot of Albertans, you know, we're, uh, you know, trying to, you know, be as careful as possible and, and understanding that, you know, we are hitting up the ODR, you know, I've gone up to uh, Marmot and, and snowboarded, you know, we, we go out on a fat bike ride or, or for a snowshoe or whatever it is, you know, I think that, uh, you know, we ha- have a lot of, uh, a lot of freedom, you know, compared to, uh, compared to a lot of places in the world. And, and like, like most, you know, we've, we've gone out and, and tried to enjoy it. So last night was no different, you know, going out for a skate with the kids, uh, at the ODR and, and really trying to enjoy uh, Victoria Oval there. But, you know, I think, you know, the, 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 the part that just really got to me was, you know, with those freedoms comes some responsibility. I mean, let's be, let's be honest. Like for me, it's been months and months of seeing, um, so much hardship, you know, uh, you know, whether it's loss of life, you know, whether it's, uh, our, our doctors, you know, being just completely overrun and begging people to, you know, do the bare minimums to, to help them out. Um, and then, you know, you go down there and, and see literally like maybe 10% of the people wearing masks, you know, and Victoria Oval is a big place, you know, but it's got a capacity for 280 people. That's a lot of people, you know, and, and just skating around the rink, you know, there was big groups of people. And, you know, I use the term crop dusting because, you know, <laughs> maybe that's a, that's a term we used in the locker room. It was maybe a bit, of, a bit more of a crude, uh, a crude remark when, you know, somebody, uh, you know, would, you know, fart and walk across the room as a crop duster, you know, and that was about the most disrespectful thing you could possibly do. So I did use that term in a, in, in a, in a sense in the same way where I just find it so incredibly disrespectful to, you know, go rip around the Victoria Oval crop dust in the place with, you know, during the, during a pandemic, you know, like, is it, is it really that hard, you know, to throw in a mask and to social distance, like our, you know, like our healthcare workers and our scientists have been begging us to do for months. Uh, and like I said, you know, and I think in Alberta, we have, you know, we, we, we have this, this opportunity to, to live in the middle of, of not completely shut, shutting down and, and uh, not completely, uh, you know, eliminating everything that we can do. Um, but, you know, it, it comes with some responsibility at the end of the day, you know, and I know I, I put that tweet out yesterday and I think a lot of people agree. Um, you get the odd comment of, of, of somebody saying, well, it's not a bylaw, you know, do we need a bylaw, you know, to tell us like not, you know, to, to, to take care of each other, you know, cause essentially I think that's, you know, that's what it is, you know, I, uh, as a, you know, I grew up just outside of Sherrod Park. I lived down in the States for a while, but I was always so proud to, you know, A, be a Canadian, you know, B, to be from Alberta, right? And, and, and I carry so much pride in that. And if you really break down, you know, where does that pride come from? You know, I think I, I describe it as, you know, the type of place we live. You know, we live in a place that really cares about other people, you know, whether that's uh, on a big scale as Canadians, um, whether it's on a smaller scale as Albertans, you look at, you know, when, when, you know, people are going through a tough time, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, the wildfires or the floods or, you know, the tornado back in the day, you know, people come together and help each other out, you know, whether it's even, you know, things more recently, like Syrian refugees, you know, like helping out the Syrian refugees uh, here in Alberta, like the sense of pride that gets, uh, uh, that, that, that that gives me is, is seeing, you know, my fellow, you know, countrymen or, or Albertans helping people out. Like, that's what makes me proud, you know, proud to be, you know, from a place like this. And so I guess that's the frustrating part now is, is you look at this and you say like the people in need now, you know, we have, you know, senior citizens who are obviously like at incredible risk. You have healthcare workers that have incredible risk. You know, I know that young people are, are also getting sick and, and it's not just senior citizens, but, you know, let's face the facts. Like we have a group of the population that's, you know, needs our help. And, and, and you know, we have scientists and healthcare workers asking us to step up and help. 
And so what are we doing? You know, like they're not asking for much, you know, wear a mask. You know, it's not like they're asking us to give up, uh, uh, you know, give up anything, you know, too severe. So I guess that was the frustration of, of just seeing that. And, and I feel like, uh, you know, we're better than that, you know, as Canadians, as Edmontonians, like we've been there for each other in the past and, and now it's, you know, not too much to ask to, to be there in, in the, in a bare minimum way of at least wearing a mask and social distancing, like we've heard for months, you know, to try to, um, you know, try to drop the numbers here. Well, and, and you say, you know, someone will say to you, well, well it's not a bylaw. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not wearing a mask because it's not a bylaw. And I would suspect that the sa- probably the same people, if it was a bylaw, would be bitching about the bylaw. Like, I, I don't, you know, I, to me, there's just this lack mm-hmm. of buy-in where, and I know that this seems like such an obvious statement. I try to steer clear of stating the completely obvious, but the longer that we kind of dilly-dally around this stuff, the longer that we take it half seriously, the longer it's going to last, you know? I mean, that's, that just it doesn't resonate with people. The, the, the parts of the world, we talked to Dr. Stephen Duckett uh, from Australia a couple of weeks ago, former CEO of Alberta Health Services. We go, how are you guys managing over in Australia? He goes, well, I had 15 people over last night for Atlantic Salmon Dinner because they locked down for a while and they addressed it. And, and we keep, quite frankly, fucking around here and not taking it seriously. And it just means it's going to continue to be a ra- reality for weeks and months to come. I mean, that seems obvious to me. Well, and I, and I guess just to even, you know, like I said, this is uh, the finish line is insight. Yes, we'll all be vaccinated eventually, right? But what's the bigger picture here? Like, what, you know, who are we? You know, as a community, whether it's a, a big scale country, small scale, you know, province and city, I, I think that's, you know, who are we? And what, what are our values? You know, are we turning into a selfish, you know, culture where it's just, I'm looking out for myself and my freedom? Or do we prioritize helping each other out and helping out the, you know, the person beside us and the person that needs a, a bit of a help? Yeah. You know, I've always, you know, you talk about Australia and, and, and I'm a big, uh, a huge all blacks fan, right? Like I've always, I've always really uh, looked towards the all blacks in New Zealand um, and, and the culture that they brought to sports. And, and I think that this, uh, this pandemic and, and New Zealand's response to the pandemic has actually been, you know, incredibly interesting um, you know, obviously they're an island nation and, and a, a smaller population, so they have some some inherent advantages in that of, of, of dropping numbers. But I think the bigger story is actually the culture um, that, that 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 country has and, and the, the the prioritization of, of community w- within that culture. Um, the All Blacks, the most successful rugby team in, uh, in, in the history of rugby and, and probably the most su- successful sports team, carries those same cultural values into a team atmosphere. It's about being there for each other. It's about the bigger group. It's about coming together as a group. It, it, you know, it's not putting your selfish needs ahead of, of the others. You know, so in a, in a sports world, you know, that, that's worked incredibly for them. But in a bigger picture, on a country scale, um, that sense of culture and that prioritization of that kind of culture has really helped them out. They came together. You know, they decided, yeah, this sucks. Yeah, it's no fun. We, you know, we're not leaving our houses for a couple of weeks. You know, we're buckling down, we're wearing masks, we're distancing, we're doing what we're being told to do for the greater good. And and I think that as Canadians, that's what that's how I picture Canada. That's how I picture Edmonton and Albertans is, you know, once in a while putting down, you know, some things that might be better for us personally for the greater good. Yeah. And I think that's the that's the kind of place I want to live. And that, I think that's the kind of place that we should all be trying to build. You've you've kind of established. I mean, I would imagine that you're probably gonna gonna tell us that you've maybe you've probably been this way your whole life. Um, but I think people have come to a more clear understanding of of what drives you and what makes you tick. Um, you're you're a fascinating follow on social media, if if for no other reason than the insane fitness things you put yourself through with these 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 bike rides, like 200 kilometers straight up mountains and these types of things that you do. But you've also got a real environmental awareness. You've been working with the NHL on on green initiatives. Uh, you have a, I can tell uh, you have a, a, an, an internal driver when it comes to matters of social justice. Um, and we don't always see that and and maybe i'm perpetuating a stereotype here but sometimes i think let me rephrase this a lot of times people will look at you know i take a look at that fox news host and what she said to lebron james when she said you know stick to dribbling the ball people always want athletes to stay in their lane and not just athletes celebrities too movie stars musicians shut the hell up and play the hits that's what they want people to do um what's your response to people that would listen to you right now talking about matters of public health and social justice and and suggest you should stay in your lane lane how do you feel about that 
Well, I think as a, as a citizen, I am in my lane. You know, I think it, I think we all are, right? You know, I think that we all, um, as citizens, you know, have a responsibility, not just to, you know, vote every once in a while, but to, to do what's right. You know, when a decision is put in your face to do the right thing, do the right thing. And I think that's, that's what it is. You know, I, I don't think that there's anything controversial about, you know, um, listening to, like I said, the advice from, uh, you know, from the experts, the doctors, the scientists, the ones that actually know, you know, what the hell's going on and can kind of help us uh, and guide us out of, uh, out of this situation um, and to help amplify that, uh, that message and do your part, you know? So I, I, I know that there's, there's obviously other, you know, topics uh, like environmentalism, like um, social justice, you know, what have you. Um, yeah, if you're an athlete, or if you're a celebrity, or if you're an accountant, or if you're uh, a lawyer or a doctor, or, you know, you work at Dairy Queen, you got a right to speak up. You're a citizen. You know, if those are things that you believe in, and those are things that are going to make the place that you live a better place, why wouldn't you speak up? It's insane. You know, whose lane is that? Yeah. You know, who owns that lane? Yeah. To make, <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know. Like, I thought it was all of us. You know, I, yeah. I thought it was like, that's what community is. Yeah, well you know, That's said. what a culture is, is what... The, the population decides is these are our priorities. This, what make, this is what makes us who we are. And this is what we're trying to build here, um, you know, to be proud of, to be proud of the place that we live, you know? So I, it, it's all of our lane. I've got a, a question here submitted by email from Lindsay, who's, who signs off as a huge Oilers fan. She's wondering if any of your former teammates in particular were notorious for the crop dust. I, uh, I oh, wonder God. if, I wonder too if many, it, too many, but I uh, can't, can't throw them out of the bridge, but what an awful thing to do. <laughs> hey, Andrew, you, uh, you, uh, represented team Canada. You wore Canadian colors in 99, correct? In the world junior hockey championship. I think it was, um, yeah, we lost in the finals to the Russia and Winnipeg. Yeah. Is that, is that, uh, first of all, not, not to bring that up. Uh, I mean, a lot of people would say, I wouldn't mind having a silver medal in an international competition. Is that the type of thing that did that drive you for like the next number of years of your career? That, that one. Oh, I bawled my eyes out. I, yeah. I, that was a tough loss in overtime to Russia, uh, you know, in front of a home crowd. Right. So that was a, that was a tough one. Yeah. So what, yeah. so, uh, yeah, so no, I, I, that's that, that's that with me for a while. Edmonton is, uh, Edmonton and Redger. And I know again next year, cause it's such an unusual circumstance with, uh, with this year. Um, but Edmonton, as we know, obviously playing host to, to what is such a, a wonderful, uh, for our family, it's a boxing day tradition. And of course I know for so many other people, the, the world junior hockey championship, what, what are these young men going through? What do you remember about that? And, and how can you imagine this playing out? I mean, I know it's different, you know, it, some countries play host and there's barely anybody in the stands, but typically when, when Canada hosts, or for that matter, the Northern United States host the world juniors there, there's 18,000 people in the stands. It, that's, that's not the case this year. What do you imagine this might be like uh, for these young star athletes? Well, I mean, a couple of things. I, I think that, you know, getting some insight, you know, into what the Oilers have done to, to set up that building and to set up the bubble, you know, both for our playoffs at the NHL level and then for, for the world juniors, it's incredible. Like, it, it really is incredible what they've done, what they've been able to pull together, um, how safe they've made that, uh, uh, that bubble. So kudos to them like a, a thousand times over and to the people that are putting in some uh, pretty insane you know, work hours to make it all work. So, um, you know, the, the logistics of that, I'm super impressed by, you know, from a player standpoint, I honestly can't imagine, you know, I've, I've talked to the guys that I know on, on NHL teams, uh, you know, obviously about the bubble experience and what that's been like. It's weird, you know, and not having the atmosphere is, 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 uh, um, is definitely unique for the first couple of games. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, you get, you get somewhat used to whatever situation you put into and, and at the end of the day, it is hockey. Um, but the world juniors, I, I mean, I don't remember, you know, the games so much as, as far as like, you know, what plays happened, you know, what goals were scored, you know, you can, you know, bits and bites here I can remember, but I do not forget the fans. Uh, we have the Winnipeg whiteout. We're in the old Winnipeg arena for, for ours and the atmosphere of a, of a home crowd singing the anthem and just, you know, it just, it was deafening. Right. Um, that's what I remember. So I, I feel really, I do, I feel bad, you know, that, that the guys, uh, uh, can't have that experience at home. You know, next year will be obviously. I, I'm I'm bullish on on people just living life to the fullest coming out of this. You know, once we're vaccinated, you know, partying like uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. making up for lost time. Oh yeah, enjoying life to the fullest. I mean, I I think it's going to be 
absolutely incredible. I, honestly, I can't wait. Like you're gonna have a blast at those one of those games, man. Like, oh, it's, buddy, it's gonna be a good oh, time. I've been, I've been yeah, like practicing you know, so, the t-shirt toss, yeah. ready to go, man. Yeah. Seriously, it's it's gonna be great. But you know, we gotta get there. You know, there's a finish line close. Um, you, like I said, they're they're making the most of what they can. Like I said, OEG's done a, a great job setting up the atmosphere. Hockey Canada is gonna do a great job. Uh, of making sure those those guys get the, the fullest experience possible, um, but I mean you can't replace a home crowd just just going nuts for you, right? I mean, There's wearing nothing the, like it. The colors of Canada, and so you've I mean next you will be special. Like you get it. Like you've you've been part of uh, an experience that 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 like you know one percent of one percent of people would experience, which is like. I mean, I, I don't even, even, even when you were back in Boston, I don't know if you mind me bringing this up, but when you gave the sort of the, you know, the, the salute to the fans and, and I think you, didn't you get fined for that for, for flashing the bird? But I just, I remember like at the yeah. time it was like, you, fe- you must feel such adrenaline and such emotion and like to score a goal and have 18,000 people go nuts. I mean, can you ever, have you ever in, in your retirement years here, you've, you're just relatively recently retired, but you, you can't really recreate that at all, can you? I mean, it's such a unique experience. No, and, and I think probably one of the things I'm most proud of is that it never got old for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I, I, I literally, through my entire career, and maybe that comes like I was drafted in the eighth round. You know, I thought I was going to play one game. Every single day I walked into the rink, I thought I was getting sent down to the minors. <laughs> my job, you know, my dream was over. So like, I literally walked into the rink every day and was just like, this is amazing. Yeah, you know, I've been there like 15 years and I'd walk up to the, you know, the buffet of pregame meal and just be like, oh my God, the salmon, <laughs> steak, I got, you know, this hotel I'm staying in. Like it was all, it was always amazing. Yeah, It really was. I loved it. Aww. And, you know, the experience of scoring a goal or winning a game or, you know, skating around and warm up with your lit, you know, no bucket on, just, you know, <laughs> shooting top shelf. Like I, I loved Aww. it. I loved every single moment of it, you know, because I was, I was quite literally living out the dream, you know, like I watched, you know, in Northlands, you know, it sounds stupid, right? But like, you know, when I'd watch warmups and I'd watch, you know, Paul Coffey skating around the ice, just dangling and hitting top shelf and warm up. And I just be like, man, like if I ever get there, like oh. I'm just going to, you know, eat up every moment of it. It was, it was amazing. And then, so to, cool. and, 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 and then, and then to wear the C like you did, which is a whole other journey. Uh, Andrew, I know I, I have to let you go. You have a meeting at 1030. I promised to have you out. So let me ask you this in closing. You're on a very, very short list and I'll, and I'll, I'll mess it up if I try to name them all. Cause I'll miss somebody, but of national hockey league players that have played both in Calgary and Edmonton. So I know like Ladislav Smead, Steve Smith, uh, Steve Steos, you, Marty Jelena, uh, Grant Fuhrer, uh, technically uh, like Curtis Joseph for, for a minute, um, but a very short list. These two teams, the Battle of Alberta, it looks like is going to happen 10 times in a shortened season with this North Division. Sam Brooks is rubbing his hands together. We're expecting brouhaha after brouhaha. What are you expecting to see? Well, the best rivalries are, are always when it's, it's uh, competitive, meaningful games, right? So if the Oilers are, 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 are having a good season like they should and the Flames are having a good season like they should, it, they'll be fantastic because the games mean something, right? Yeah. Um, I think rivalries, you know, they only go so far if, you know, one team's great and the other team's, you know, at the bottom of the league. You know, you can muster up something out of it, but, um, but when, there's, when there's points on the line and playoff spots on the line and you're trying to send messages, you know, for a first-round matchup or whatever it is, uh, you know, that's when you get the, the just amazing games. And I think that's what you've seen you know, you know, over the last couple of years, but uh, the best battle of, battle of Alberta years was when both teams were, uh, you know, were saying to themselves, like, we got a shot this yeah. year. You know, yeah. like, we, we've got a chance and, and these guys are standing in our way. And, and you know, that's when you get the good stuff. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm excited for it. You know, I, I think that like, uh, they'll be absolutely sick of each other you know, by, by the end of it. And, yeah. and sometimes that makes for some pretty interesting games if, if those two points are what you need to get into the playoffs. Yeah, well said, buddy. Hey, we'll let you get to your meeting. Very happy New Year. Thanks for joining us on short notice. It's great to see your face. Always good to see you, buddy.
That's Andrew Ferentz, uh, for a longtime uh, National Leaguer uh, for the Edmonton Oilers, of course, the Calgary Flames uh, as well. And uh, I mean, my my, my uh, who cares about my journey? His journey is the one we care about. But I, as a as a fan, I lived in Calgary through his years playing for the Flames, and I lived in Edmonton through his years playing for the Oilers. So I watched a lot of of uh, Andrew Ferentz on that blue line. Um, kind of a, a a player that uh, approached the game, I think, like he approaches life. He, he he could run a power play if he had to, and he could also mix it up. And I uh, really appreciate his perspective on this. A former star with Team Canada's uh, World Junior team as well back in uh, 1999. Sam, you were saying, I, I could tell that, uh, or it looked to me anyway from the expression on your face that when, when Andrew was talking about being at that Victoria Oval uh, yesterday. You were out shooting some time-lapse photos yesterday. Were you, it, it looked to me like you were maybe in that neck of the woods? Yeah, I, um, first of all, I, I just... Andrew Ferentz is my favorite Oilers captain, and and this conversation just ever? solidified what ever. Yeah, I'm gonna say ever. Wow. And and it's not, and it's it's the off ice leadership. It's the way that he t- walks the talk. It's the way he became an ambassador for the city. It's the way he gets behind causes that he believes in. Um, I I have so much respect for the guy. So there you go. That's I just that. I just want to throw that out there. Uh, so but. you're you're putting him ahead of Gretzky, Dougie Waite, Mark Messier, Bucky, Kelly yeah. Buckberger, Kevin Lowe. Yeah. Uh, wow. <laughs> I think Shane Corson but, I mean, wore like, the C. Didn't Corson wear the C? Well, I, like, yeah. also forget, like, remember, I'm 31 years old, right? So it's just like, you know, Gretzky was leaving the Oilers when I was, like, two. Right. You know? Right. So in, in the time that I've been watching hockey, Ference was the man. Were you, are you an 89 born? I'm an 89. Oh, so you're, yeah. So, I mean, that was, yeah. you were you were born in the Flames Cup year. Mm. <laughs> Okay, uh, this the, the just, Oilers do have a cup in my lifetime. I will yeah, be able to they, say that they do have a cup in your lifetime. The Leafs don't. The Habs do. <laughs> but I, I will say, so the Canucks the, definitely don't. Yeah, but like yesterday, it was this. Um, it was this beautiful afternoon, and Kelly and Sophie and I decided to just like go walk in the River Valley, and and she would walk the dog around, and I'd take some time lapses, and just like get some beautiful photos of just the gorgeous winter scenes. And we started at Horlack Park, and I just I loved. The the skating rink at Horlack Park was busy but very respectful. People were keeping their distance. That's people good were to all hear. Over the place, I got like a great video, and I, I said to Kelly, I was just like, you know, I'm loving seeing people skating in this in this t- photography I'm doing. Like, why don't we why don't we drive down to Victoria Park and see what's going on there? Yeah. I looked at the traffic attendants turning people away from the overflow parking lot and just kept on driving. Uh, I like I could I couldn't stand were, to even set foot. You in were the park. doing your part. You were doing your part. Uh, a, a question here from Scott. Scott's trying to paint me into a corner here on our YouTube uh, chat, and and he wonders. So he says so, and I can tell he thinks he's got his paintbrush out painting me in a corner. He thinks because his so has like five or six O's. He's like so Ryan. Who do you cheer for when the Oilers and the Flames play? It's simple. The Oilers. I'm under contract with the Scott Edmonton Oilers. knows what your other job the Edmonton, is, right? He knows. Oh, that's yeah. why he's asking, I think. A born and raised Calgary kid. It's not, it's not a secret. I mean, if you look out on the internet, there are photos of me wearing Flames gear. You can find it if you dig hard enough because I grew up in Calgary. A born and raised Calgary kid. But we've lived in Edmonton. You can tell I've answered this question 150 times before. Uh, Edmonton has been home for 15 years, and I am a proud employee of Oilers Entertainment Group, technically a contractor. Who cares about that? And uh, if the the Edmonton Oilers win we all win and uh and if the Oilers win a cup I'm, I'm pretty sure I get a ring so so I'm so I'm I'm cheering for the Oilers in the battle of Alberta that's a fact and we're raising our kid as an Oilers fan so there you have it but I am one of those weirdos uh, that you know for example in you know in 2004 when Calgary had the unlikely cup run uh you remember that against Tampa Bay didn't work out great for Calgary but but you remember there were people in Edmonton with flames car flags and and some people thought nope nope there's no I got no room for that and then the Oilers, two years later after the lockout, went almost all the way against Carolina, and there were some Oilers car flags in Calgary. And, and then other people said, nah, I got no, nah, I'm not, nah, uh-uh. So I'm one of those weirdos that if the Oilers were knocked out of playoffs and the Flames were still in, I would cheer for the Flames. If the, you know, if the Oilers are in the playoffs, I'm cheering for the Oilers. But I will draw the line there. In other words, you won't see me rocking a Toronto Maple Leafs car flag. I'll certainly not rock a Vancouver Canucks car flag. So I, I draw the line Ah, see, that's different. I know. I I would. It's kind of weird, actually. I'll acknowledge. I I would get behind the Leafs or the Habs before I'd get behind the Flames. Well, that's fair. But that's because you're born and raised exclusively in the Metro Edmonton region. 
right? You, you don't, you know, I mean, I have, you know, pe- pe- people in Edmonton, when you want to talk about Chinooks, you want to talk about Southern Alberta, you want to talk about, co- you know, open strip coal mining of the eastern slopes of the Canadian Rockies and the Bighorn region. I mean, that's where we grew up and played. That's where we've camped. I mean, I've, you know, anyway, I think it, it broadens our and, and enriches our perspective. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time, so I can't keep spinning my tires here on this, Sam, because we need to remind folks uh, that tomorrow, if you're tuning in per usual, you will not find us and it's not because sam and i are 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 getting lazy and taking the day off but it's because we're very excited to be putting out uh, our first ever private zoom party for our patreon subscribers you would say well that's rather elitist i suppose so but it's also good business because these are the folks these are the backers that are joining us on our journey as we build what we're building here so if you want to be a part of this uh, broadcast it's going to be a very special show you go to ryanjesperson.com click on the patreon link that's where you can make a monthly commitment to support the show five bucks or so and it allows us to do cool things we're going to be hiring other journalists we're going to be broadening our reach 2021 is going to be a big year for Real Talk, and we're super excited about that. So tomorrow morning, 8.30, same start time. It's going to be a private Zoom party. We've got room for 500 people, so you want to be in the first 500 there, and we'll be sending out the link today on our Patreon homepage. If you already support us, if you're already signed up, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We're going to send you that Patreon link a little later on today, and you can join us in the private party. That means that this is our final public sign-off of 2020 and we're grateful to be partnered up you know what's coming up right now with the team at local waste now local waste has been in the waste management game for more than 25 years based out of western canada based out of right here in alberta going up against the big faceless garbage monoliths these big international companies you've got a problem and you do business with the big international company, get in line on the 1-800 number, buddy. That's not the case with local waste. Local waste wants to keep your business if they've got it and they want your business if they don't currently have it. So much so that they're giving you the first name basis and direct phone number so they can talk to you. Chris and Lauren Labas here would love to take your call at 780-242-9746. They'd love to devise a waste management solution, garbage and recycling for your business, big or small. You can check out localwaste.ca. Local Waste is also the proud sponsor of a little something we do every week called Trash Talk. All right, so this is a great way to wrap up the public part of our broadcast week. These are submissions as received at talk at ryanjesperson.com. Your chance to rant or rave through the week. We picked the best ones like this one from Dontario. Dontario says, thank you, Ryan, for the opportunity to vent. I'm so disappointed by what I'm seeing from my fellow Canadians. We say we want to protect the vulnerable and save small businesses and emerge from this pandemic. But it seems to me very few of us are actually serious about making it happen. Sounds like Dontario might have been listening to Andrew Farron. Says the Boxing Day madness at the malls nearly broke my spirit. Seeing politicians and entitled political staffers traveling to exotic locales after telling us to stay home? Unbelievable. It's time for some real talk about accountability and integrity and looking out for our fellow Canadians. That from Don Terrio. What about this from Serena? Serena says, Ryan, you said we can rant and rave about whatever on Trash Talk, right? That's right, Serena. She says, well, my rant is this. Pick up your dog's poop at the kid's toboggan hill. What the hell, people? Also, Happy New Year. That from Serena. And a Happy New Year right back at you, my friend. And this one from Tanya. Tanya says, Ryan, I've been paying keen attention to your Twitter exchange with one of Premier Kenny's issues managers, Brian Bateson. This one. Anyway, buddy is out of his depth. She says, I'm very interested in the Globe and Mail story about Alberta leaving more than $300 million of available funds on the table that could have gone to support lower income frontline workers because I am a lower income frontline worker. In fact, says Tanya, 
Tanya. My blood is boiling as I'm writing this email. Mr. Bateson publicly states the Globe story is inaccurate. His public Twitter bio confirms his employment as an issues manager for the Premier of Alberta. Yet when pressed by you, Ryan, twice to elaborate on the specific inaccuracies of the story, Bateson swallows his tongue. And don't get me started on his unsolicited yet gratuitous and unprofessional swipes at another journalist. I remember, says Tanya, when working in the premier's office used to mean something. It's one thing for Jason Kenney to talk about fiscal responsibility while spending $3 million a year on staffers or $30 million a year on his war room. But it's an entirely different thing if those staffers barely crack minimum standards for entry-level employment away from the taxpayer's trough. That from a very ticked-off Tanya. And here's my trash talk. It is along those same lines, and I'm pulling an audible. I had a trash talk from earlier, but I'm changing it after talking to Andrew Nikiforic and Kevin Van Tegum today about the lack of consultation on important environmental matters by the government of Alberta. Whether or not you agree with people, you were elected to serve all people. Let's not forget in opposition when you were critical of the government for failing to consult. What's changed now with regards to public expectations? Nothing. Now, there's a culture of we don't like you, so we ain't talking to you. We know it. We live it. But that doesn't fly. It is up to you as an elected official, municipally, provincially, federally, to listen to the people, to care about what they think, whether or not you agree with them, and to implement public policy that is for the public good. So come correct. And Happy New Year, everybody. This, another edition of Trash Talk. We'll talk to you live Monday, January 4th.